Classic violence. Slowly. Classic violence. Silently. Classic violence. Has no motives. Today, Sergio Martino. Terror strikes in a blinding flash. A flash of colors. Only an insatiable desire for strange. Morbid. Devilish kicks. His perversion knows no limit until... Yes, yes, y'all, it's going down right now. Episode 231 of the Triple Shots of Moods and Horror Podcast is coming at you live and direct with the homie JP, also known as Double Shot J, and with special first-time guest, Tyler, up in the house. And of course, I'll be your host, the M double O D to the Z. What's going on, guys? Gia. I feel like Tyler needs a nickname. I know. I, I just yeah. Tyler is like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> that's it's, it's definitely plain as day, but, uh, what do you do? <laughs> I'm, I'm just not going to start making up shit and make him feel uncomfortable right off the intro. That would be weird. I, I have very paper thin feelings. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So what do you, do you go by anything specific? Um, usually just Tyler or douchebag. Um, <laughs> or douchebag yeah so i mean i got it half right then so i got it tyler right the then. douchebag tyler the douchebag well i remember that nothing word. nothing in particular sometimes people don't remember my name so how do you, you know, actually pronounce your last name tadeo it is filipino i've been saying tadeo my whole life tadeo so i i figured it was pronounced differently than i was reading it tadeo so yeah so it's like today wow it's like three syllables for like five letters yeah, whenever I have to like give some of my email on the phone and at work, I always spell out my last name because there's no way they're gonna get it right if I say that. Right, right. Yeah, I I, I knew it was pronounced differently than I was saying. It's like David Dicaccio. I would say Dicaccio because I don't give a shit. Yeah, but you know <laughs> it is it is what it is. But but yeah. So episode two hundred and thirty one, Sergio Martino Dux. This is the second one. What did we do in the first one? We did torso. Your vice is a locked key yeah, room. And, um, what the fuck cannibal the mountain god or something right I haven't seen, that was the one no, i actually wait, haven't what? seen i thought we did uh no we did mountain of the cannibal god torso yeah. and uh and vice yeah, for it was sure. your vice it was your vice i think yeah your vice log yeah cool yeah yeah that's a good show too so sergio martino two all right man um yeah I, I, it's actually kind of funny i was laughing about this last night when i was rewatching the films i was like we should have just called this the george hilton show for christ's sake I mean, yeah, it's, it's funny how that worked out. Was, right. I didn't even realize he was in all of them either. I, wa- I actually like watched all three yesterday because I watched Strange Vice like two weeks ago. So I just said, I'll, I'll just watch it again and refresh myself. But like, this guy's just in all of these. Yeah, man. I mean, Martino had quite the run of films here, but he worked with like the same actors in like every film. Like George Hilton was in, you know, all three of these films. Edward Fennick was in, you know, two of these three. Agree. And of course, he was in the other ones we did. One of the other ones yeah. we did too. Taurus, or not Taurus, your vice. And um, yeah. yeah, so like you, you always, that's the thing with Martino. Like he had this five film run and everybody, in those films was pretty much the same like ivan rashavon he was in a couple of the films and yeah he was in at least three of them yeah so same people over and over again which is you know it, it's it, it's interesting for reviewing if it's like first time watches for yourself because then everything might seem a little bit convoluted if you watch them all together because it's like the same yeah. people in every movie <laughs> yeah one thing i noticed about watching all the colors of the dark this time watching all these so close together i would suspect that's probably the last one they made together because it really seemed like him and edward really like kind of had like a good director actor relationship going on and they tried like more ambitious stuff in that movie and kind of like took more comfortable direction i'd say yeah it's kind of cool to see like how he developed over time 
Right, right. Well, it, it actually kind of is. I mean, you know, I was thinking about this again with Martino, man, because people always talk about like, you know, um, long string of, you know, films by directors that are just kind of untouchable. Like, you know, Cronenberg has a, a really long um, list of yeah. continuous films that are just really top notch. And I know Fulci does at one point, Argento does too, but people kind of leave out Mar uh, Martino in that conversation a lot. But you got to think, man, like, the first like five like mystery you know giallo type thriller films he did was your strange vice myth war the case of scorpion's tail your vice is locked room all the colors of the dark and torso in a row oh good like, that's yeah. like incredible when you really think about it so and then another conversation run. that martino gets left out of his and um, they were in a short period of time that's the thing too. it's like he almost gets over look because he did all that in like two three years like, right that's insane Right, right. And that is just the craziest thing. Like, you know, and another conversation he kind of gets left out is, you know, being one of the top notch Giallo directors too. Like he, he ended up doing seven Giallos and they're all solid. Like that's yeah. the crazy thing. Like he actually did more than Fulci did. And, you know, he tend, you know, I mean, he, I think he did more than, than, well, I guess probably not now with Argento, but I'm just saying his, his name doesn't get lumped into those conversations as much, which is insane. Just by Honestly, those five right just there. even in terms of like master of horror or, you know, the, the conversation when we talk about the greats, uh, even the Italian greats, I feel like he amongst like hardcore fans. Sure. But like, yeah, it's always Fauci Argento, but really Martino is fucking hella good too. You know, it depends who you're talking to. Like, if you're talking to some people that are a little bit older, maybe a little bit more familiar with Italian films and stuff, like Bava's name gets thrown out there. Like, when I think of directors, the first thing that comes to mind is Fauci Argento and Bava for myself. Martino's definitely, 50. you know, you know, yeah. he's up there for me also in Lindsay, but you know, I'm a little bit more familiar with Italian films, and generally, like those names kind of get left off. But, but I think Bob is up there too. But I mean, Martino is just he's totally forgot. And I mean, Lindsay a little bit too. Lindsay did a lot of you know Giallo slash, and I say thrillers because like his were a little bit different. They weren't your typical standard Giallo type films. They were a little bit different, but they're really good. You know, and I think those guys need to be lumped in a little bit more in those conversations with, uh, you know, the all time greats in their in their genre fields and stuff like that. So, but yeah, like like any director, Italian director of the times, they were journeymen. You know, I mean, Martino did a lot of spaghetti westerns that were pretty cool. He did the sequel Arizona, Arizona Colt Returns, which is a pretty cool film. Um, the, the the crime film Silent Action, which is really cool. Um, he did on and on Menage, which was. Uh, um, a spaghetti western that's really cool and you know he dipped into the cannibal thing and you know it's just it's crazy to think like these guys they did them all they did them all he did post-apocalyptic films of 2019 and shit like that it's just it's pretty fucking awesome man pretty awesome stuff i think martino is like hella underrated as an overall italian director and i'm, I'm happy to be doing a, doing a second uh, show on on martino because um you know he needs the he needs the clout man he needs his flowers you know his his at least his movies feel like they have like their own personal like stamp on it too. Like I can like especially with like Year Vice and like uh, and Strange and like uh, Strange Vice. Like it, they really feel like they're oh, like they're from like the same person and they they feel a little different than like what you were getting from all those other guys at the same time. He kind of has a signature style that some of these other guys that uh, really don't have. Yeah, I mean, his were, I mean, the narratives in these movies are actually pretty different in a sense, if that makes sense. You know, they, they, there yeah. seems to be a little bit of an industry standard sometimes when it comes to Giallo's, like there's, you know, the the procedurals and things like that. But his are, I mean, starting with The Strange Vice, man, that one was pretty damn different. Yeah, know, they all the, seem a little bit more ambitious. Right, right. Like, I, I think the twists and turns in that one, like if, you know, I remember watching Strange Vice a few years back, or not a few years, a long time ago, and being like, holy shit. Like that's that's fucking pretty crazy where that thing goes and shit. Yeah, and I feel like, like his stories are like the actual like narrative is more ambitious than what you typically get. Right, right. It's not very. It's not kind of like a, it's not from point A to point B. You know what I mean? Where it's kind of straightforward yeah. and so like this one does yeah. kind of bounce around and gives you these twists and turns, and you're really not expecting the shit. Um. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's all. That's always a really good thing. That's always yeah, a really good thing. So. It feels to me he's more willing to like take chances and just where he goes with things, and maybe it doesn't always come together or work all it work all the way. But I'd rather see that and see something different and feel something different than just you know like you're by the numbers procedural. 
Yeah, he he's one of those guys that like his movies are beautiful too. He always has great cinematography. Mm -hmm. The scores are generally really good, but it, it's more about the narratives though too. I think that's kind of what separates the good giallos from the bad giallos is like the unpredictability and just you know taking chances, but without without being forced. You know, like yeah. sometimes when you watch giallos, like sometimes the twists and like things they come out of left field and just like it, it's almost eye rolling. Yeah, decent, it's almost know? too much. Right, you're just like no, that doesn't really work. But these ones don't have that forceness to them they come off very naturally like holy shit that totally makes sense because if you think back in the narratives especially with miss warwick you're like oh shit totally right that kind of makes sense to why this happened and why this person died and you know it's like okay you yeah know. You, you know what's kind of interesting about tyler actually coming on this show is when we because this is a patreon picked show and tyler actually led the charge in picking these three films and i didn't we didn't even plan that it just <laughs> oh really kind of happened yeah, I think Strange Vice and All the Colors of the Dark are two very underrated uh, giallos. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, what we do here when we have a first time guest, we usually get into a thing called five questions. I was kind of like illy um unprepared this week i just i've been kind of congested and shit and just other things going on and stuff so gonna probably have to uh, wing this a little bit but uh like honestly man like i have actually met you just recently met you at uh <laughs> yeah. at cinema wasteland didn't really get to sit down and like have you know a personal conversation and stuff like that it was kind of i think that's the way it was with a lot of people it was yeah it hectic. was more of a group setting We're just it, hanging out. it, it was group and it was hectic and it was just a lot of running around and a lot of drinking <laughs> so yeah. Um, so essentially like I don't really know you personally that well so some of the questions are gonna be like whatever but you know um just how about just let the people know a little bit about yourself like how you got into horror and uh, we'll just start with that and stuff okay well I've always kind of just like had like the natural draw to horror I didn't have like somebody showing me a bunch of horror movies I was younger like a lot of people go through but I did like go to Blockbuster a lot and I was very into stuff like Goosebumps and Are You Afraid of the Dark when I was age appropriate. So like the horror section, you had all these sick like VHSs with all this like gruesome covers. Like it was like it was like the forbidden fruit that like I always was like so eager to be a part of. So like I kind of just like only stayed within like the real popular like mainstream stuff until I started to like got out of high school. And that's like when I started to like go on the internet a little bit and try to find like the stuff right outside like the immediate like the immediate zeitgeist of popular horror movies where you start to delve into stuff that like people don't know about like the argento films and the fulci films like they're like they're staples in horror but you don't really know about them until you get into horror if that makes sense right right yeah that kind of i mean i, I see where totally people, for me yeah where yeah. people start out too i mean i think you're as you know as a newbie into every anything you want to kind of start with the basics right and kind of yeah. go from there and stuff so it kind of makes sense especially when you're at the you know the blockbusters and things like that those movies are going to be right in front of your face and stuff so i'm assuming you were born in the 90s then yeah i'm a 91 90 oh yeah okay. we're like the same yeah. age oh crazy okay yeah so that you guys can relate to each other a lot more than that makes complete when you said goosebumps and stuff i was like yeah okay that makes complete yeah. sense yeah um yeah. like it was a little bit i was a little bit too old i like i remember when it came out and stuff but yeah, i'm just, I, I'm files just got me real young too that was one thing i watched with my dad my dad always watched the sci-fi channel where there's a lot of like horror sci-fi stuff playing in the 90s and we watched x files so i got into it like through that too that was definitely an influence on me so right. w uh i guess this is a bonus question or something but I, I was curious i don't know if i asked you this i probably did before but i've kind of forgotten for the listeners like when did you hear us um so around that same time where i was looking for more stuff i think around like 2010 2011 i really i started like i want to collect and it was like just when blue rays were getting hot and uh -huh. but even prior to getting to that i was just like looking for videos online of people like listing off their favorite of this, like their top them favorite of that. So I found Cool Duder and then I eventually found <laughs> Moods. Cool Duder was my intro. Like, I was like, this guy's got the sickest basement. It was just like a library down there. <laughs> and eventually, I, so then I eventually found Moods and that was around the time that you guys were starting out. So I caught on like right at episode one. Wow. I was like, yeah. Wow. So I kept listening and then I was like, I need more podcasts like this. And then I list so I started listening to the skeleton crew. Those were those were the next people I found. Uh -huh. And then you kind of right. like guys kind of locked like that, where you uh, you linked up with Dave and all of them. So yeah. it just like naturally became a thing where it's like all, all the podcasts I listen to like hang out and podcast together now. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's cool. I, dude, you're day one fan of most. You know? That's pretty cool. Not yeah, really. I, I don't like saying fan, but you know what I mean. I know what you mean. Yeah. I remember like driving down to like go DVD picking, listening to you guys on YouTube. Yeah. And you used to uh, leave us voicemails too. Yep. Yeah. You left us a bunch of voicemails. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So like you've been like 10 years deep into the game, man. That's pretty funny. Yeah. I, th- I think like a lot of us like that were in the early stages of YouTube and stuff like I was watching YouTube for probably a couple years before I actually like started making videos. Same. And it was the same thing, man. Like I would type in like DVD or something. And it, cool dude, it would, it would, would be the first person I watched to come cool up, right? Too. Yeah. So like his introduction for a lot of us was like, you know, into the YouTube games, like I was collecting and stuff, but, but like just, you know, for the whole video making, dvd style and shit like that yeah it was it was fucking it was cool duder but i've had multiple people tell me that you know it was like well when i first started watching youtube and collecting this stuff it was cool duder and moods and i'm like oh my god i'm in the same fucking conversation as cool duder (laughs) it's so funny like he he really was was like a big pioneer just having all these different movies that you were just like hearing someone talk about on a relatable level like you can make fun of the girl he wanted now and i know his videos are like fake and stuff now but like he was very relatable (laughs) at the time and he was and, and he like was getting, he was very real too like he was yeah. he was just like very honest like genuine fan back in the day well he was one of the first guys that i remember you know not talking about everything mainstream like he you know he would talk about like his top 10 favorite shot on video films and his top 10 favorite like weird obscure TV films movies. and he yeah. was the guy that like introduced a lot of films like private parts and uh not the not the fucking um howard stern, howard stern movie you know the one from yeah. the 70s yeah yeah I know what um, you mean. The Paul Brattel movie. Right, right. And like Crawl Space and not the Kinski one, yep. like the other one. Yep. And like yep. movies like that where nobody really knew about and they were very obscure, even on DVD and stuff like that. And he was the one talking about those things and, and, and kind of got it out there. And, you know, I respect that for that. Like he had his own niche and like he was the one bringing that to the forefront. It was him. It was him. Yeah, he definitely like that. A couple of the, that was, I was about to actually bring that up. Like, there yeah, was, that was uh, a big yeah. one for me. He, he kept always yeah. talked about bad Ronald. Yeah. About, it made oh yeah. Bad Ron. Those are like yeah. the three titles I always remember from <laughs> cool dude are always talking about going. Okay. Yeah, Cause like that was something I eventually actually this year, like when they did an archive sale and I just bought a bunch of stuff. So I didn't know when there was going to be another archive. sale. I'm like, I'll buy bad Ronald. I remember this. And like, so I don't think it's a masterpiece or anything, but it's, it's a fine, good little movie. Yeah, I, lo- I, I like it a lot. It's fun. I like all yeah, three of those movies, but the one that like I really, really fucking fell in love with was Private Parts. Man, that movie is weird movie is and good. strange, and and it's still sitting in obscurity. Basically, it doesn't have that Blu-ray release. I mean, Bad Ronald's got yeah. his love. Actually, Crawl Crawl Space is still kind of sitting in obscurity too, because people kind of forget that yeah. it was a, it was a very, very early Wild Eye release. Remember when Wild Eye was yeah. like they were different. Their logo was different. They were releasing different stuff, and then they started to release like modern and indie stuff which is you know a lot of it's trash and stuff but that was one of the early releases that went out of print and it, it really did fall into obscurity because like nobody has a copy of that. It's crazy it goes for crazy money but um but private parts is the one that i've i've talked about many many times and many lists and stuff like that and you know everyone that gets back to me that watched it and stuff said they really liked it and stuff and you know i mean that was cool dude man he was the one that brought that one i don't know where the fuck he ever found that movie that but. guy's a really interesting director. That guy made uh, Death Race 2000 or something, the one with Mary Warrenov, and he made this comedy called Eating Raul. That like, oh. Both you guys would love that movie. If you yeah, seen I've it. heard of that. No, Eating it's- Raul, I love that movie, man. That's got uh, That's got her in it also. Yeah, that movie's hilarious. I got I got the Criterion Blue in an eye shot of me right now. I'm just eyeballing it. <laughs> right. Right. Fucking dogs going crazy out there. Um but uh, yeah so we'll get into um what's uh do you do you have an all-time favorite horror film uh my all you know i want to say for a long time i always said it was suspiri and that always has kind of remained in my top but like guns in my head now i honestly would probably say possession with sam neil <laughs> and israel and johnny possession is that possession? Yeah. wow crazy i'm very high on that i'm very high in Suspiria and I'm very high in Rosemary's Baby those are like my big three wow okay yeah very very interesting yeah Possession man I you know I I feel like when I have conversations about that movie with people they're always like some people are just so unsure about it they don't know what like how to perceive it or how to take it how to absorb it I think there's just so much going on in that film that's like that it's like it's not one of those films that you can just kind of watch once you really need to check it out a bunch of times and shit like I was the one thing I take away from Possession is like is the the acting in that movie 
from Sam Neill and what what's the Elizabeth uh, or um Ad uh, Johnny is uh, yeah fuck man so good but the scene in the tunnel dude I I I just I can never get that shit out of my mind yeah I think the issue people have with it is like it's a very different film than a lot of films in horror and it's a film you can't like watch like thinking you're following a narrative because that's not the point of the movie no it's no like, it's not it's, it's, it wants to be deconstructive of the idea of of like the terrifying like bonds you're breaking like with through divorce and loss and just like it's exploring all those concepts in like a self-performing yeah. way and, and it's, it's not meant to tell a story it's like it wants you to feel the movie yeah exactly it's 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 telling you a narrative like in a non you know linear type way you know like in a non-spoon felt fed way and you really gotta you know kind of decipher things it's kind of like it's 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 almost like the textbook definition of a film that was could have been labeled as elevated horror before that became the stupidest fucking term ever yeah Yeah. i mean that's that's a good example of how elevated horror has always existed yeah exactly it absolutely has it's just like it got popular for a minute and then people had to put a label on it and it just was convenient that a lot of them came from a24 well it's it's these people not really understanding the history of horror films and like people from the outside looking in look at horror films as you know very exploitive and just and just bullshit like they don't really have anything to say and i'm like are you fucking serious because your goddamn yeah. comedy movie with mike myers has something to say no horror films have always been about stating something there's always been commentary in films and that was the best way to showcase it but without and and, and the, the funny things people just didn't take it for what they were you know, and then and then when these movies started being made the way they are in you know the last 10, 15 years, people were like, oh man, horror films got something to say. Now I'm like, yeah, are you fucking serious, man? Yeah, it's been I, they've honestly, been doing this for 50, 60, yeah. 70 years. It's just the stories are so much different now. They are a little bit more complex and stuff, but the commentary in films has always been there. I mean, were you not a fan of Romero films and stuff? These were all stated. Yeah, and even like I remember when Jordan Peele. Uh, first film get out was getting like a lot of buzz and people were saying like it was like the first time that you know they took the uh you know social status and and stuff of of black and white people um and and said something about it i'm like dude fucking people under the <laughs> stairs bro <laughs> I, <laughs> I, sh- I showed that to my girlfriend last month ever ago love- right yeah it's a great like, example. no discredit to jordan peele because i'm glad he did what he did and i i love that film and i i love the it, what all came about of it but like s- some of these articles and stuff i was reading i was like dude you guys are seriously novices in this game yeah i i absolutely agree because i kind of deal with people like this that are like um sometimes that are very knowledgeable about film in general in certain areas of film but like horror it's like never not even a drop in the pan and it's consistently written off in a lot of aspects of like not having as much merit as other things is ridiculous yeah i mean people look at it as like they see the they see the the titles of films and you know the artworks and stuff and they just they already judge and they can't take it serious but you know something like hood, good example like yeah. everybody somebody who hasn't seen that pictures it is like this goofy like spoof type thing mm-hmm I, and it's you know, not at all <laughs> no it really isn't it really isn't no it packs so much commentary in that and stuff and yeah it's it's frustrating it's frustrating and I, I i talk with people all the time about this man i really do and it's like you try to convince like you just you, i, I kind of stated in a way where i'm like i'm not trying to be smarter than you i'm just like i'm just telling you how it is and, yeah. and you can take it for what it is but you know at the end of the day i don't really give a fuck if you if you want to believe what i'm saying or not <laughs> it's there yeah unfortunately people don't want to hear that anymore which is really sad because that's the kind of thing that like sparks intelligent film conversations right right (laughs) the way the world man um yeah so if you do you have like a favorite subgenre of horror yeah um so i really i'd say pretentious is that a subgenre? <laughs> I, mean, I just, I did just say Possession is my favorite horror movie. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, Rosemary's Baby in Suspiria and didn't, like, didn't all I, the highbrow stuff. Didn't I buy you a Possession shirt? JP, was that the one of I got course, you? Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah, that's kind of fucking yeah. weird. Yeah. Um, so these are going to sound like really weird subgenres, but I really like movies that take place in apartments, <laughs> and I really like. Um, Non exorcist religious movies. Hmm. So like I I got like Rosemary's Baby being one I'm very high on. I really love The Sentinel. That's a movie I'm very high on too. That's like one of my one of my favorite horror movies. Like you know, um, you, you, 
You know what? Actually, man, the Sentinel for me is like a perfect 10 out of 10. That movie is fucking crazy, dude. It's fucking like, scary. Like it's so slept on how scary that movie is. It has so many weird oddball characters and it just it just develops into something so strange, dude. Like uh I can never look at um what's her face from the vacation movies ever the same. Uh cuz I I'd seen the vacation films before. What's her name? Um the mum uh Griswold. Um the fuck's the actress's name should i know anyways but she right. stars in the sentinel and she's like she plays this really oh, i didn't know that was her yeah, Al- yeah she, allison reigns or something yeah and she stars as like this really strange lesbian she's in this weird relationship oh, and, like, oh no i know what you're talking about yeah that girl yeah that yeah and this is pre that. this is pre yeah. doing vacation movies right like god yeah. sentinel was 77 or something like that so like yeah there's yeah, so cool. much uncomfortable stuff like that that's legitimately yeah. scary yeah dude but the whole pr- the whole idea of the movie is super cool because like you know it's kind of like the gateway to to fucking hell and shit like in this huge apartment but i'm i'm a big fan of apartment style f- films too like that's why i like Pulcher that's why Price i laughed 3. because i know moods is a big apartment yeah guy. i think yeah. there's something about apartments where it's like they all have history because you have all these different types of people that have come in and out of it and mm-hmm. it's like if there's the idea that you can leave a part of you somewhere like an apartment is a good grounds for that and there's like an idea of like being surrounded by strangers and being enclosed it's just like it makes for like you could do a lot of different things about it right right yeah i love apartments uh horror too i i've always kind of and i love how I, it just has a vibe to it yeah <laughs> right right oh what's your um, beverly d'angelo that's what her name is that oh. cast in that movie is absurd everyone in that movie is like a rising star that became huge or like a star from like the golden age of Hollywood that was on their way. Yeah. Well, Sardin, he ended up being, you know, obviously the star of Fright Night and stuff. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's interesting. I mean, it's, I mean, I guess you can really kind of make up your own sub genres if you want. It's not really, and, and you know, a, it's not really a, a thing set in stone, right? I mean, films yeah. are set in high risers and yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Just for the argument of making it more defined, I am extremely high on Giallo, or mm-hmm. I would honestly consider that like a potentially my favorite subgenre. Right. Well, that's cool, man. Do you have a favorite actor, actress? Uh, my favorite actress is Nicole Kidman. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I, I, was, a, I was not expecting that at that at this point yeah. i was expecting beverly d'angelo but you know <laughs> <laughs> nicole kimmon play my nicole kimmon and Je- jennifer jason lee are my favorite actor. oh I, I love jennifer jason uh, lee man yeah. she's done so many underrated movies man oh dude she's, she's in a lot of cult movies she's worked with a lot of great people like she's like interested in taking kind of like daring roles i like i like her oh, a lot absolutely absolutely man and yes. i also for actor this might sound this might make me sound like an old man but my favorite actor is probably humphrey bogart wow okay good actor yeah. do you ever see the movie with jennifer jason lee in it called heart of midnight no but i wanted to buy that last kino sale and they were out of anything but dvds i'm actually like interested in that movie that movie sounds good it's on my radar yeah i reviewed it years ago it, it's really it's a strange strange movie it, it it almost has like a lynch feel to it like a lynchian kind of feel to it it's it's really bizarre it's a really yeah. bizarre film but she's like so good in it though yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm sure i'd like it then because lynch is like a top three director for me yeah lynch is uh he's definitely one of the most unique people um ever to grace you know to be a director man i i love his shit man i i i I was always so like enthralled in his movies because like no matter and and the the funny thing about david lynch we we talked about this many times in the podcast too is like i love when people try to decipher what like a racer head means and at the end of the day lynch is like it means nothing (laughs) yeah he refuses to answer this is a great interview of the world like He's like, I think my most spiritual film is Eraserhead, and I go care to elaborate, and he just goes, "No." <laughs> That's fuck. It's so funny, man. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. but dude, Eraserhead is fucking amazing, dude. Yeah, incredible. It, Nothing like it. It's like a, it's like just a montage of like bizarre thoughts. It's a fever dream, dude. Right. Yeah. It's just like, oh, what could what what could you think of next? That'd be like the weirdest shit ever to throw into a movie. It's fucking yeah. weird, man. It's so weird. I love it. Spe- speaking of Lynch, do you know who Richard Lynch is? <laughs> yeah, I know who Richard Lynch is. That fucking Joe. To this Shut day, up. it still makes <laughs> me fucking laugh. I'll never forget 
their reaction. Nobody knows the original. I'm like, what the fuck? He's been in like 250 fucking now. movies, man. I'm like, he's like the one of the, he's like one of the most recognizable cult actors considering he fucking burnt himself while high on fucking acid one time. You cannot recognize Richard Lynch, but yeah. All right. <laughs> Still makes me laugh. It's hilarious. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm sure that was more than five questions. Well, you forgot the main one for Italian Horror Month. What's Fulci? The- Oh no! Gentile. Well, no. I'll I'll get into the rapid fire. I'll get into the rapid. Fire. Oh, okay. But That's part of the rapid fire. Just okay. one one random awful question. If you could remake any movie, what would it be and why? If I could remake mm. any movie. Do like, you feel um, like a movie? Like, is there a movie out there? Do you feel like? Because, like, I mean, there's so many people out there that just despise remakes. They get so pissed off and shit like that. And like, I feel like there is movies out there that could possibly use a remake. You know, like yeah. I mean, they they see, they tend to remake movies that don't necessarily need a, a fucking remake. You know, yeah, that's kind. Of, I, I think that's the problem with remakes is that, you know, you're remaking a shitload of classics. You're not remaking like fucking, you know, uh, some like half-assed '80s slasher film where you could probably do better. You know, kind of thing, right? Um, yeah. Is is well, there yeah, a I film? Don't... If you ever watch a movie and go, "Fuck, man, now that, that would that's a great movie." The one movie I always said was Blood Beach. I liked, I love the idea of Blood Beach, but the movie comes, it's not that great. It really isn't that great. And I, I mean, maybe I, I don't know. I just always thought that would be a fun one to remake, but it's my so, quick answer. It's a I stumper. Know. I know it's, it's, a <laughs> it's, it's something to ha- it's something hard to have, like right off the top. Okay, you know what? All right, I got one, and this is gonna sound like a super super off the wall pick so uh-huh. um one of the things like i don't really have any beef with remakes like the, the remakes i do have a beef with it's just like the same reason you guys have beef with remakes like they're just like cynical they're not made with any heart they're not made because they want to make a movie better they want to cash in an existing property like they're mm-hmm. not trying to bring relevance to like a movie that's maybe like a little bit outdated or could like use a refresher for like a new a new person but at work but anyways um, so I think you guys have probably both seen this movie. This movie is from 1968 and it's a Japanese movie called Kuroniko. It's mm-hmm. a ghost story with like, it's a black cat ghost story. And it's just, it's, it has beautiful visuals. It's a great story, but I think it's just limited by budget and like of the time of being almost 60 years old now. And that's the type of movie. I think they could take a story like that and make it better. Right. Yeah. And- yeah, I really, I really like Kiraniko. I think it's a great movie, but I, I get where you're coming from for sure. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a great movie too. Like, I, I love the movie. I would even put it like amongst like my top like 100 favorite movies. But it's like a movie I think that like you could definitely improve on. It's a great story, and it's something that would like bring it would introduce a new like section of cinema to people that's not necessarily like talked about or appreciated. Right. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. That's not bad that's an interesting pick that's an interesting pick um so you, you you know you mentioned before like you're a collector and stuff like that do you have a favorite uh like boutique label police <laughs> company <laughs> yes <laughs> criterion it's criterion well that makes sense yeah. man. The, pre- the pretentious set no i'm just bugging man yeah. i'm just bugging yeah. how many no. criterions do you have now tyler uh, um total items like 315 but i got several box sets on movies but around 400 yeah that's crazy yeah, yeah so that's criterion, criterion bro criterion for me man is like it's one of those things where i would love to have more um but yeah. it's just in, where i like it's just it's just not Stupid. affordable to collect here because they're so expensive and like we don't get the 50 percent off sales and shit like that like even if i was yeah. to order from the state like it turns out they just end up being more than the half price yeah, anyways, yeah, yeah. right so, or than the I price uh, yeah, I do an enormous amount of my buying during the fifty percent off sales. I I, leg- I don't pay more than fifty percent for any of these things. So there's, I know there's four sales. Right. I'm gonna have time to do everything, so I just load up during those sales. And like sometimes you can just I buy from like Facebook groups for like under twenty dollars. And, <laughs> and right. what do you what what do you typically spend on a sale? I know it's like th- like three hundred or something. I've seen for like story. criteria, it depends. Like. Um, if it's cross a month, it might be more. If it's like the flash sales, I've been like really fortunate where my girlfriend's giving me a really large gift card but for the last two sales, so I could like spend basically like four hundred like carefree because there was a like more than half of it comped already. Yeah, 
Right. But I, yeah, I try to do that. And like, if you do that and like, there's, I'll, I'll just for, just for arguments, say I spend like 300 or 350. Like I, there's, there's lots of like credit cards available out there where you can just get no special financing for like one, for like one year, no interest for like spending that much money. So like, uh-huh. it's really not that if you just wait and buy only during those times, it's really like yeah. not that big of a deal to do something like that. Yeah, no. I, I've done, I do, I, or even the, I do like the paying for thing a lot too. Yeah. I'll do that like with that. Kino sometimes. I don't spend that much on Kino. I'll spend like 150, 120 bucks. Yeah. I usually get like a hundred somewhere around there. Yeah. But I, I watch obviously a lot of different types of movies. I don't just watch horror. Like I, I came from horror. I have like a deep appreciation for horror and I always slant to horror, but like I, I watch literally like I don't care what year it came. You're out. a cinema fan. What, yeah. I don't care what country I came from. Like I just, I like when it, for that type of interest criterion is the best you can get. Right. Awesome. Awesome. Um, JP, do you have anything else you want to add to that before I get into no, whatever, go ahead, whatever, bro. whatever I wrote down for rapid fire? I literally did this like off my dome, like 10 minutes before we even got on here. So it's like, everything's just kind of like, whatever. You don't uh, get to think long about these Tyler. No, it's, okay. it's literally just, it's one or the other, or it might be a yes or no question too. So it's one word answers. Okay. Or one and whatever. So, so rapid fire. Uh, that's why I wrote it down. Um, th- these would be originals too. So, uh, Dawn of the Dead or Day of the Dead. Um, Dawn. Popeyes mm. or chicken fillet, chicken sandwich. Um, Chick Fil A. He cut out. Uh oh. No. No. Uh, s- sports or no sports. Sports. Hills have eyes. OG or the remake remake oh wow uh the saw franchise yes or no yeah i can vibe with it hmm. vincent price or christopher lee vincent price price uh shot on video or found footage <laughs> shot on video really <laughs> I, that surprises me uh full moon or trauma trauma <laughs> nice halloween horror or christmas horror oh good one christmas horror Nice. Mm, nice. Paranormal activity franchise, yes or no? No. Fuck you. <laughs> Italian horror or North American horror? And I say North American because I lump Canada and the US in the same. Um Italian. No. Uh hard tacos or soft tacos? Soft. Yeah, always. me me too. Yeah. Uh, Carpenter <laughs> Carpenter or Craven? Carpenter. Blumhouse or A twenty four? A twenty four. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I go with A twenty four also. Uh Rob Zombie, yes or no? Yeah. And finally, Argento or Fulci? Argento. <laughs> yes. Correct. I do like them both quite a bit though. I, I do too. I, I do think, too. I think most every people year. <laughs> answer Argento on this man every time. Yeah. But most just like, people do. If Argento just had like a long like at least with horror had a longer career and like He's got more big. He's got more tentpole movies that like are memorable. I think, but like Fulci, like had like I don't know. It's actually kind of tough to say because it, it is. Does. And the more that I think about it, and like after watching The Psychic and uh, Lizard and the Woman's Skin again, they've gotten closer for me because yeah. those are great movies. And Don't Torture Duckling even got better rewatching it. Yeah. And, and I already so, had it. So <laughs> I like the Gates of Hill trilogy and all, or the Give the Gates of Hell trilogy and all. But I actually prefer the three movies you reviewed this time to any of his other movies. Really? Wow. Yeah. See, I, I like the Gates of Hell trilogy a lot too. Like even House uh, by the Cemetery has came up for me a lot. And then like that's not even including fucking Zombie, dude, which mm-hmm. is a, a, a goddamn classic. Yeah. Like, I, like- I might take Zombie over most of Argento's filmography in terms of like rewatchability. Um. Maybe Cecilia would be higher, but like I love zombies. Zombie yeah. is a, 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 probably yeah. one of my favorites to yeah. watch. I might be a little biased because I love Suspiria, Deep Red, Tenebrae, and Phenomena. Like I like all four of those movies quite a bit. I mean, as do I, except for Deep Red. But yeah, if if I take my like five favorite Argentos versus like my five favorite Falchis, man, Falchis way up there. But like in the long grand scheme of things, too, like Falchi is my favorite director for a reason because like even his like what you would so-called be like terrible films i like a lot more than argento's bad films so if i was to stack up one one against the other man fulci's coming in way fucking higher for me man i feel yeah. like i haven't seen fulci's bad 
films so i don't really have much to i mean i seen door into silence and beyond the grave or whatever and i liked both of them i thought they were decent yeah like, and that, and, that, and that's the thing like those movies a lot of people do consider to be you know terrible but then i'm like man like have you seen argento's giallo <laughs> yeah I, but i actually really like giallo that's oh, my problem that's I gave crazy it a seven i i just Fulci? i can't that movie is bizarre to me man it's just like yeah. so not good i mean argento this year like surprised the shit out of me man with dark glasses was actually yeah, production awesome. value on it was like blew my mind dude because he like didn't have that production value for so long and like this one you know he did it right you know so italian I, production value kills weren't bad like i even watched sleepless again the other day mm -hmm. and i was like damn i really like sleepless yeah yeah it's it's not i think, I think sleepless <laughs> is my biggest our gentle blind spot i haven't oh, seen it wow now, i own it and i just haven't it's because it's two hours i just haven't had the time to like put two hours like in like the right block to to watch it i'm very weird with, with how i watch my movies like I, like if i'm watching something at night like i, I want to watch something that like i don't have to like be completely focused on and it's, it's not like something that's not gonna be as mentally taxing you mean like late at night yeah like like before i'm going to bed but yeah, typically yeah. i don't have two hours to kill when i get to that time yeah I, i'm kind of the same way like to me if it's like late at night, I want to watch something like City of the Living Dead versus something heady like. You yeah, know. I never, I never watch, I never watch anything foreign or something like heady late at night. But um, yeah, for Fulci, the only film I've only seen like twelve Fulci films. Um, but for the ones that I haven't particularly liked, they're not even horror films. Mm. Which which films uh, were those? Uh, I didn't care for Conquest. Oh really? I love Conquest, man. That movie hey, has I like can, the craziest can, like nightmare like visuals to it. It just looks like a dream. I can see why people would like it, but I just I don't know. I just was not on board with it. And like this one's kind of a horror movie, but I really didn't like The Devil's Honey. Oh yeah, I one. mean that one's that's definitely a totally different type of flavor. It's more like a it's more exploitation kind of i don't know it, yeah. yeah it's, it's different it's, it's a totally different flavor for Fulci, man. Like, but he like honestly, actually, I've never seen the only Fulci film you know out of his like everything big like I've, I've seen 29 the one film i've never seen is silver saddle the 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 other uh spaghetti western that he's done um yeah i definitely want to check out his spaghetti westerns i i really like spaghetti westerns and i always kind of tell people if you like, like giallo like um spaghetti westerns are a really good companion piece because they kind of do the same things right yeah i i highly recommend for the apocalypse and uh massacre time are both great like he only did three and they're apparently silver saddle is really good too i've just never seen it but uh um so three for three in that in that aspect so kind of yeah, interesting i haven't seen, seen a Fulci film i didn't like so well actually the so only far. film i don't like from from Fulci out of the 29 i've seen is the eroticist it's it's a fucking political satire and like i just feel like the <laughs> the jokes just don't translate they, they yeah. just don't translate to me like I, I i guess if i was italian and understood a lot of you know the little you know the the little things that go along with those jokes and stuff right because you, you know it's obviously yeah. done like that too like i wouldn't understand all the political policies and like where yeah. these jokes are really coming from and shit and and every time i watch it like there is some goofy shit in there that kind of makes me chuckle but overall i'm just like dude this thing is not working at all for me yeah so. And like if you've made 30 films like you're gonna make some that aren't great like everybody like everybody is that's made 30 films has made like some movies that aren't great like hitchcock made plenty of terrible movies yeah. he's considered like one of the greatest like commercial directors ever yeah it, the thing is with hitchcock he did like 30 great movies though <laughs> like it's just yeah, yeah he has a, quite a few good ones but like there's like, some <laughs> real bad ones like that nobody mentions like, like peppered in there yeah yeah but yeah i get that um okay well that's uh that's it for um the questions and stuff and i guess intro uh do you have anything jp uh i just had a quick question for you guys um more some moods because i know tyler did a little bit but okay. did you end up um doing anything for uh black friday sales moods i just I added on i just added on to my vinegar syndrome um order i just picked up the the vsas that were announced and I think a couple of the sister titles and that was it. I, I honestly, man, I, I heed and hawed with the Severn thing, but I just, I couldn't bring myself. It was so fucking ridiculous, dude. Like 
the prices are so insane for Severn, but like I had to spend like over 200 and something just to get free shipping because it's 20, they have a $22 flat shipping. So if I, if I ordered one thing, like if I was just to order four flies on gray velvet, which is already 55 American plus the 22 conversion, it was $103. It was going to cost me for that one title. So yeah, to make it worth my while, I needed to get the free shipping. I needed to knock off that 22 and it basically in, entailed me getting the entire package which was already 238 american so it was working out to like over 300 canadian and i was like fuck this i'm not doing this man so i really only just added to my black friday pre-order which i believe was the two vsas and three sister titles so like five titles that was it that's all i did i didn't buy anything on amazon i didn't buy anything anywhere else the severn thing actually put a fucking it, it kind of it put a bad taste in my tough. mouth this month it, or this this weekend and i just said fuck black friday this, like th- th- honestly dude that like 55 is crazy well yeah. that sale is still going on and you know yeah maybe because <laughs> uh you know i mean it look i i did i understand that the damn conversion thing is horrible and the mm-hmm. shipping is horrible yeah um i ended up i did end up fighting on the severn sale uh i went ahead and got the argento bundles because one i I don't think they're saying that that four flies isn't going to get its standard release anytime soon i mean we hear that all the time but yeah i think that this case it might actually be true just because i know that title has had such a hard time of coming out that i think there's probably some kind of deal to do a limited run of that um and then i think also that i just really wanted to know what that other film i i just kind of wanted that other film just because even though it's like a comedy or whatever just to complete my argento collection and i kind of wanted the argento book so i did buy it on that and i threw in a bunch of like old seven releases that i still haven't picked up Mm. Um, so I did that and then and I did hit up the vinegar syndrome sale. I got the two VSAs that got announced, um, and a couple of other title, like older stuff that I'd missed out on. Um, not, not a crazy amount, but I just got a couple. Um, I usually do more. I usually do a lot more. I didn't do much for that. And then I actually, we were talking about it last week moods. I did end up getting the sus- subscription thing to uh terror vision the oh really the yeah. um just i'm gonna check it out i'm gonna see it see if it's worth it or not buy the, my 10 run and see what happens see mm-hmm. if i like it or not yeah why not why not check it out i mean if you didn't go crazy in other areas might as well do something right yeah, yeah so. tyler um so there's the Barnes criterion so going on. So like I've been picking stuff up like that all month. So that kind of just cut into the budget, but there was no one I was hammering for anything for. I did end up buying a little, Oh, I want, I got four flies too from, from uh, Severin and to chop off to make it a hundred. So I could get free ship thing. I got the two, uh, Alex, the Iglesias four K's. I've been wanting to check them out for a while. But yeah. I mean, the beast. Crazy. Yeah. And I picked up like over like, four like real cheap like catalog 4ks of stuff i was just like ready to take a second look at like from amazon so was, yeah i did grab reservoir dogs as well for 13 on 4k which actually, i thought was a good price I'm, I'm gonna go back and grab that i grabbed a couple things i grabbed like i grabbed the northman i grabbed sicario like interstellar and everything everywhere all at once on 4k because they were like 9.99 and that was it have you seen the northman before yeah i saw it earlier this year did you like I it? Liked it? Yeah, I liked it. It's um, I don't think it's as good as his other two films. No, but no I it's think definitely. it's like. So I agree as well. It's different. Yeah, it, it was it's a lot still different. A good film though. Yeah, it was different than I expected. There was like a little bit of like weird elements to it that I wasn't really yeah. expect. I didn't really know what to expect from it because like yeah, it was just different. But yeah. I felt like it probably could have been better, even what they were what he yeah. was offering with it. Mm-hmm. yeah i don't know i was slightly disappointed it's beautiful though it's got a really yeah. good aesthetic to the film it's very beautiful on the big screen too uh, yeah i agree it was gonna be, it could have been better um I, I did it one thing that did disappoint me a little is like it didn't feel like there was a whole lot of tension or mystery it said like this is what's gonna happen and right. it happened 
<laughs> yeah, it, it it is kind of fly by the numbers the way it ends too, right? It's like yeah, it's just like it said. This is what's going to happen. They tell you that the whole movie, and then right. that's what happens. <laughs> right. Okay, I guess. I know. Yeah. That, yeah, it definitely leaves you going. Oh well, I didn't really see that coming. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Like, it wasn't bad. Like it yeah. was good. I can't pretend it wasn't a good movie. But yeah, it's like it's one I definitely want to check out again. But I don't think it's as memorable or as like um as unique as his other movies. Definitely yeah. not. Definitely yeah, not. definitely not. No. Okay. Um. Yeah. No. Fucking black. For- yeah, you're right though. Yeah, because it is what Cyber Monday today, right? So yeah, the seventh at night at midnight, from what I read. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I'm gonna go back up and think of Reservoir Dogs. I haven't seen that in a long, long time, and I always like try to. My do- favorite Tarantino movie. Yeah, yeah, I think mine is The Hateful Eight at this point. Really hmm. nice. Yeah, I like the cowboy movies. Nice. Yeah, I just love how Reservoir Dogs. It's like there's like the first. It's the first Tarantino movie I've seen, for yeah. one, and I I've, I've watched it a million fucking times. I love that movie. The Hateful Eight, man. Like when that movie starts, it just reminds me of the Great Silence so heavily. Great film, great film. Like Corbucci, like oh my god, yeah. dude! Like it's just so insane. How much that fucking reminds me. I mean, that's he's obviously influenced by the Great Silence for that. He probably yeah. took a lot of homage uh, homages. Like he. In in Kill Bill, he uses the the score from from uh, the psychic. Yeah, like he yeah. just listens to him. Yeah, I mean he does that with, from Bernard Herrmann's Twisted Nerve as well. Oh, there's just it. so many things in he those. Also, Kill Bill. Oh fuck, there's so many things, man. This is crazy. He uses the score from Strange Vice and Mrs. Ward in uh, Kill Bill too. That's right, he does. Yeah, he's like just that. a massive fucking cinema fan. Yeah, yeah, like I feel like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was like, I get it. You know more about sixty cinema than I do. <laughs> yeah, I love he, that movie, though, man. Yeah, yeah he definitely, fun. he definitely likes to. I, w- I would say borrow stuff from Italian cinema and shit like that. It's like it's like Necro, the the producer, man. Like he, like some of the music that he's produced over the, like the last twenty years, you'd be like what the fuck like he, he he's sampling some of the most obscure and only Morricone fucking uh you know music and and all these like crazy scores from all these movies and shit that people had never even seen you know and shit so you're hearing all these samples you're like fuck that's so cool man yeah but, like, but now no but now the movies about- yeah now the movies are starting to come out on better releases people are like oh that's where necro got that from it's from this movie yeah. <laughs> you know it's like oh, yeah. like <laughs> No matter how you feel about Italian movies from this era, like you got, like you got to give it up that they have like incredible music, incredible oh, scores. The music was always a highlight of like most movies. That's yeah. what draws me yeah. into them. I, I love like the very like theatrical and very like loud and musical. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, and like I said, most of the time they they really do fit. They really do fit the the product and stuff, which is you know such a bonus um unlike you know a lot the problem with indie filmmaking these days is they'll they'll just put in like metal soundtracks and shit and you're like oh really whatever yeah. was royalty free <laughs> fuck you're just like oh my god it's fucking ruining it okay all right so that is going to conclude the intro and uh yeah we'll be back with some uh sergio martino films here in a minute yeah Yo, who this? Yo, Moods, it's your boy, the ill-mented funky child, calling you to remind you that the featured reviews on this episode contain spoilers. Aw, oh, yeah, man, that's right, brother. Thanks for the heads up, playa. Now go back to being an unproductive asshole. Fuck you. I tell your listeners to stop being so dumb, silly, sensitive. Yeah. And now, our feature presentation. All right, so getting into the featured reviews here on episode 231, Sergio Martino, Volume Ducks. All right, so we're going to start with the 1971 Giallo titled The Strange Vice of Miss Wart. Now, this is one of two movies that was released in 1971, and I, I, I'm going to bring this up because it's actually kind of funny. Um, so this movie right here was released August 13th, of 1971 oh, i have a january 15th release date yeah i'm just looking at the <laughs> indb or whatever um okay. 
but uh, then <laughs> the the weird thing is you don't see this very often, but I, I, I who knows if these things are actually even like correct to the dates and stuff. But the uh, case of Scorpion's Tale was released. It says August 16th of 1971. So these movies were technically released like two days ap- or three days apart. <laughs> So, and, and it, the only reason why I even realized that on the INDB page is because I like to do these in chronological order. And I was like, well, two are from the same year. Which one came out first? And I was like, what the hell? These are like three days apart. When you ever see a director release two movies within three days and be it's of like, this quality? It's <laughs> almost, I don't think <laughs> it's like almost unheard of for like two, for a director to release two movies in the same year at this point right yeah right Time i mean it was west, it, it, it was a little bit more common in these days with these journeyman directors but like two films of the same type of caliber like you know yeah. giallo like you know sometimes it'd be like in a different genre and things like that and stuff like Fulci did release movies in the same year that were turned out to be really good um but yeah, yeah i no. suspect these guys got contracted to like make movies and they just like went to a location just rolled they did productions back to back right right I mean, it, and then it also makes sense why a lot of these movies had the same actors and stuff in them too, because you know, if they're yeah, for doing sure. multiple productions, you're like, well, shit, man, I like George Hilton in this one and this one. And you know, it just kind of all made sense really. Uh, but yeah, the strange vice of myth war, Miss Worth, also known as, I think it was also known as um, blade of the ripper in the U S back in the day, which I actually have a DVD yep. under that title. Uh, I think there was another alternate name. I think in the UK it was called next and your net, the next victim. It, it, all these movies have tons and tons of different titles yeah. and shit like that. But I love like, it when you're watching one of these movies and then like the title screen comes on, it's a different movie than what's on the cover. <laughs> right. Or the or when you buy a movie under a title and you realize you already own it under a different title. That has not happened to me yet. <laughs> I think that has happened to me once. One time, I'm generally really good at knowing all the different titles and stuff like that. But I think it happened to me one time, and I was like, "You got to be fucking kidding me! Crazy as shit." Um, I think it's uh, I, can't, I can't remember. I'd have to think about what it is, but I, I know I, I know it's happened to me once. Um, but uh, yeah, so the strange vice of Miss Ward, um, 1971, starring George Hilton, and we joked off the top of the show that this might as well have been the George Hilton show because he's in all three movies. <laughs> uh, the beautiful Edward Fennick is in the film too. Um, we got Ivan Rashavon is in the film. Uh, pff, fuck, just multiple people, man. It just, you know, he, th- those names will pop up again later on in the show. All right. So synopsis, an ambassador's wife discovers that one of the men in her life, either her husband, an ex lover or a current lover may be a vicious serial killer. All right, so we had all seen this one before. I've never seen it, but I just got to say off the top, dude, Edwidge is literally the most beautiful woman in the world, especially in this movie. I know, man. She just got one of those. She's so unique looking. Insane. I love her. Yeah, she's uh, she's so unique looking, so memorable. Yeah, she has a presence in these movies. Like you're so drawn to her, and she can really hold the lead down, which is kind of a problem in some Diallos because like you don't have an Edwidge in it. Right. Yeah. Have you seen this before, Tyler? Yeah, this was my second watch. I watched it last year for the first time. So when the when the Blu-ray came out, so it was a little. It's not like it's something I've been sitting on and revisiting after a few years. Mm Hmm. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen a few times. I mean, like I said, I think the Blade of the Ripper DVD, I think might be a different version, might be shorter. A lot of those American cuts of these films back in the day were a little bit shorter. I'd have to I'd have to double check that. But I I think it might be a little bit different. Not 100 percent sure. Um, I'm still rocking my shameless Blu-ray. I never even picked up the Severn one that came out years ago, believe it or not. Um, Same version, though. It's not cut. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, thoughts. Uh, here we'll start with uh, we'll start with you, Tyler. Your thoughts on uh, the strange vice of Miss Ward? Uh, I thought it was pretty good. I, I knew going in, I liked this. One thing that I know like really stuck out to me uh, the first time I saw this was the score. And, like for me, with these, like I, I don't like by nature. I, you guys have I know you guys have talked about this a lot over probably the last month, but like the nature of Giallo and just a Ital- and just Italian. And, general is like where everything a lot of things are just like jumbled together and they leave stuff out and like sometimes you gotta like kind of like take that with a grain of salt as far as the storytelling goes but what's like really important like that they nail down is stuff like the score like the cinematography the sets the violence like that's like really like what i look for when you look these movies and uh uh the score on this one is like one of the most underrated 
scores. I never really hear this talked about. I think it's like legitimately one of the best ones. Edgewood does a great job holding it down. She has that perfect like doughy eyed look that just like makes you so. Her eyes are beautiful, bro. Yeah, she has yeah. like she has this gaze that's just like so alluring, yeah. and it's just like a control is seen like all on its own. Does she have like? Is she wearing contacts in this movie, or is she wearing contacts in all the colors of the dark? Because her eyes are darker in that movie, and I think in this one, does she not have green eyes? In the other one, she has like really dark eyes. So I'm assuming um, one of those. She must be wearing contacts. I'm not actually 100 percent sure what a real color, the real color of her eyes, because that's some a common. Eyes do change. Well, it's it's a yeah. common thing in these Italian, you know, crime and giallo. Like you notice that a lot with with uh, actors and stuff like that. Even like Ivan Rocha, of, of course, they made they make his eyes look a little bit different in one of the other films there. Um, yeah, yeah. With that's contacts, a plot point in a different one though. Totally, totally. But I've noticed yeah. that in other films, like you'll see a lot of contact wear in like certain giallos and shit like that like you can just tell like those are not the real eyes and shit like that i think it's just a common thing that they do in in giallos and stuff so i just kind of yeah. thought of that i just kind of thought of that point right now because fennec's eyes in in color of the dark are like dark yeah well it wouldn't surprise me on either of those even if both of them she had contests because those are really like she's the star of those movies like right. it's the edgewidge movie right right especially in colors of the dark too man i mean the whole movie yeah. is just like it re- literally ra- revolves around her you know presence of like you know as a reality or you know not reality kind of thing um yeah, yeah the, the the score in this movie always always compelled me because i don't know who the composer is like it's it's done by a woman actually um nora or Orlandi. yeah and like i mean i've seen she has credits of films i've recognized but i don't i'm not familiar with the name that's the thing like i've checked this out before i just i don't know i don't really know who she is it's very melancholy and i think that's what sets it apart because most most scores are like more up tempo and this one's not right right yeah i know this she one didn't definitely. do a ton of films it doesn't seem like at least yeah she composed for 16 films um and then worked on in music department on a few others like double face i'm, I'm, from, yeah. I'm familiar with that movie and stuff and death walks on high heels she's their coley film oh, and yeah so there is there is films on here that she worked on that i'm familiar with but yeah just otherwise which is it's interesting because a lot of these giallos like it's the same composers over and over again it really is like it's nick it's nicali it's fucking Morricone. it's you know it's all the like um you know it's tons and tons there's like seven or eight composers that are used over and over again in like every yeah. fucking movie um but yeah just, was just cranking them out i love that guy yeah oh dude that guy has like what he, well, he had what 200 and something credits or 300 yeah. credits or something like it's just nuts how many movies that guy worked on i think he's the greatest composer of all time yeah he was he's fucking man. man his his um his uh music for the great silence is like ridiculous man he's incre- he's incredible oh my god i love it's Morgan. so catchy man so incredibly catchy this is crazy um but yeah you're you're the strange vice of miss Wart, man um this this is one of those perfect examples of a giallo that like follows the you know the um the genetic the the genetic makeup of giallos but goes in a different direction and it does it well it totally does it well and i i think this one you know it took a little bit of chances but it totally paid off because what separates this from some of the other ones is that everything made sense as to why these things were happening and stuff i think it's it's a very we're we're probably gonna have to spoil these because I don't know how you talk about these movies without spoiling, especially this. No, one. they're they're all like the red herring spiral machines. Right, right. <laughs> but I think this one's done so differently that they have a killer dubbed as like what? What is he dubbed? The sex maniac killer? I think they even call yeah, him in the just... third movie too. Or like in 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 the colors. Of, I think in that one too they they say the, the sex maniac too, which is kind of yeah. Fun. I think they just like write him off as like like some sex maniac killer. They don't give him like some profound name. Like, yeah. just I mean of- that 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 makes sense for like. <laughs> catholic italy right like, right the sex maniac killer <laughs> the sex maniac so this movie this movie opens up with like a woman getting totally fucking slashed up and shit and then it just you know kind of cuts into the narrative and then we yeah. get like a couple other kills and then you're like as a viewer you're going well what the fuck like who are these people and why are they getting killed and shit but then it it's it soon tells you why this is happening there's literally a guy going around in italy or whatever it is and and he's fucking <laughs> slashing up random people like he's a sex killer and so that's where the narrative takes off in a different I think direction it's technically austria is it is it austria said. yeah yeah 
So, and that's where the narrative takes play or takes off differently in this film because some of our main characters, hence being, um, you know, George Hilton's character who plays the, he's plays the nephew of, um, of, uh, the guy who just passed away and stuff. Um, and then his got, character's name is George, I believe. Yeah, it actually yeah. is George in the film too. <laughs> I found and that then, funny. <laughs> and then you got, and then you got Edward Fennage's um, husband played by Alberta de Mendoza. Um, he's involved in this and he got, uh, Ivan Rajman's character who Jean, who plays the ex boyfriend of Edward Fennage. He's the potential you know, major, major red herring in this film because he's, he's, he's always cast so perfect in, in a bad guy role because he looks the part. Yeah, he looks like a bastard. He's really he nefarious looking. He really is. He's so perfect. Like, I don't know how you would ever cast this guy as a lead as like a playboy. Like George Hilton is perfect as like that, you know, that good looking playboy type character, very trustworthy yeah. type character because, and that's why he gets all these roles in these movies because he has that look where Ivan Rosha, man, he's just perfect in these roles, man. So the casting is really, really good in the film too. And a lot of recognized characters, but all these characters come into the film with these, with these parts and the way it unfolds is actually really unique. It's a really, really unique. Type. It's actually very different for what you get with the leading lady too, because it's almost like, okay, so she has her husband who she used to sort of escape from her ex, but she still sort of has this lust for her. her well, ex. She, ba she basically married um, the, her husband to get away from um, Jean or Jean yeah. or whatever, because he was a fucking, Jean. he was like a yeah. sadistic little asshole and stuff. Oh, and yeah. she never, she doesn't even love her husband, Neil but this was her way of escaping. Yeah, she's this very unhappy shit. in that relationship. And then she meets this other dude. So she like, typically you don't get a lead who is sort of this, like almost like, I think it, it's sort of influenced by like the sixties, like free love era. Get that yeah. vibe from it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, well, it like me, he's also like a big famous, like he's like a big, you know, rich ambassador and stuff like her husband is. And he, you know, Julia is just a base. She's a fucking, um, what do you call them um trophy wife that's all the, that's all she is to him right mm -hmm. so yep. i mean it, it makes sense in those times too like rich people with the trophy wives and shit like that they, they have an understanding just put it that way so yeah just in general that like kind of just sets it apart too is like this movie seems like really willing to explore like female sexuality and desire in a non-judgmental way where there's mm -hmm. not a whole lot of movies in this time period circling that that topic right mm -hmm. right it's kind of funny because you have a you have a this this killer going around like totally hacking up women and very proto slasher type as you know even for giallo sense man it's like it's literally like a stock and slash type thing i think it's pretty yeah. interesting how how they're doing this in 1971 and stuff like that and, and it's also weird how like um essentially this killer the person you know that there's a killer that she thinks is somebody that she knows like one of her boyfriend slash husbands yeah uh slash ex but uh then another like random person <laughs> like kills the killer yeah. and that it's like that's a final girl in another movie well that, like, that's, <laughs> that's one of the most unique things about this narrative is that that's when as the viewer you're like introduced to what the fuck just happened like we have this sex maniac killer just killed by you know his potential victim but that's where the whole narrative takes this plot twist in like the whole plot or the you know the idea that they're trying to accomplish with using that sex killer in their plan they have to change it up yeah it's a complete curveball it's a total yeah, curveball a i love that in the narrative because now they're like holy shit, we can't keep killing people like the way the sex maniac is killing because that's not because he's fucking dead we can't blame it on him in, on him anymore i think yeah, that's like, so i don't cool. think i've ever seen that in another film yeah that's because yeah, essentially in the narrative the sex maniac killings have nothing to do with our core narrative it's so cool it yeah, literally it's, has it's actually really interesting and yeah and Dude, and it I seems love, almost like ahead of its time. It in, does. In and that's what I said. Thought. Like this one separates itself so much narrative wise. And like, I love the way they introduced George Hilton's character. And then of course, when we get the twist with, you know, George and Neil and, and of course, Jean or Jean too, you know, like they're, yeah. they're all their connections and stuff, but like the way George is introduced is through, um, her friend, Carol, which is, uh, George's and Carol are cousins, right? Yeah. They're cousins. And, uh, and then how that all plays out into basically it's money hungry shit it's money hungry shit you know we get that type of deal and stuff like that too but but i like the way that that goes down too and like the way carol gets killed 
and you know how that whole shit plays out too because you know it, it's just I, I don't want to give every little detail away but i think that's very cool and and very kind of it's very unique on how they twisted that right yeah. there it really is it's, def- how- it's definitely a strong way to um, like throw a red herring out there and, come, and change the years of the film and get you thinking about it that's just good writing it really is man and that and that's again going back to the narrative and the writing and stuff is like this one definitely sticks out like a sore thumb in in that category of doing something different and writing it well but making it work without going at the end going well that's just a left turn that's just a whatever blah 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 no this one works on all levels man great performances too man everyone's so good in this film fucking george hilton's such an underrated actor man he really is super good yeah, you never really hear him mention. Like, well, I think people when you're talking about Italian films too, like you're just more drawn to the women in general. True, like, but George Hilton, yeah. he was also known. Like, if you're not so much into West or spaghetti westerns, like he was, he's very well known. Like, he did a ton of westerns. Like, he probably did like 20 westerns, man. Oh uh, yeah, I'll so, eventually run into him then. That's you know who I've been running into, like watching these spaghetti westerns is uh, Luigi Pastilli, who's in um, Your Vice and yeah. a couple Baba movies. That's why I love when they pop up in those. It's so cool. I swear you can't even watch any film from this era, like in the 60s and early 70s, without recognizing at least one person in, in the film. Like, they're yeah. in so many of the same different types of film. It's crazy. It's just crazy. Yeah, the first time I saw The Good, The Bad, The Ugly, and then like Luigi Pastilli comes, I was like, I fucking know that guy. Yeah, I right? Know. Right. <laughs> it happens to me all the time. Like, you go, yeah. on my, you go on my letterbox and you look at, like, you know, the most watched actors and stuff, and it's so funny who's on there. It's yeah. like it's all these guys that have appeared in like every Italian movie I've ever. And I'm like, Oh shit, totally. He was in like 19 movies. I watched what the fuck. <laughs> yeah. I definitely have a couple of people in my top, like 20 that are, uh, they're just like background characters perpetually. Like so many movies, like Lynn Shea is my number two. Cause she's the background character in like 30 movies I've seen. Right. Right. I know. It's so funny how that happens, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no, this one, this one's got some pretty like, he, you know, for, you know, the, t- the type of kills and stuff. I think the kills are actually a little bit graphic, even for the time and stuff. And, and like I said, they come off as being very slasher esque. Like this feels like a very proto slasher, just in the yeah. elements of like the stock and slash and the, like, the way they're getting knifed up and shit. It's, it's pretty vicious, man. It's pretty vicious. I've always, I've always felt like Giallo set like a really good context for slashers for to, or to develop. Like they're, they're very violent and they're very musical. And I think like that's what like the best slashers really became. Like even right. if you look at something like Halloween, like what sticks out to you about Halloween, just like the stocking, the stocking kill and like the, the, the star. It's just yeah, incredible. Without that score, Halloween is nowhere near as successful. Absolutely. Mm. It's just, it's incredible because of that. It just completely transcends its genre because those elements are so good. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I don't know if you guys ever noticed this, man, but I think I noticed this every single time that scene where Edward Fennick and um, George Hilton's character, that when they're fucking on the couch there, like mm-hmm. he opens up yeah. her ass and you can see her pussy from the back, man. Yeah, you can. I was like, Jesus. <laughs> I yeah. noticed that. Right? Yes. Like I always know, I always forget when I'm watching and I, and I'm like, oh yeah, totally. But that's crazy. Right? <laughs> yeah. Just- well, I think back then, you know, like you, you didn't have hd <laughs> you know what i mean i don't think you would just think it wouldn't show yeah now now the transfers are so good you're like oh ah. shit i just saw lips there yeah yeah <laughs> i forgot was, what was, movie it is but like somebody's dick is in a movie now that wasn't there before oh on terminator you can see arnold's dick now because of hd <laughs> like when he comes out of it he just like walks down you literally see his schlong just like bouncing back and forth <laughs> oh my god that's nice. ri- that's ridiculous <laughs> uh, that's great yeah yeah but uh. speaking of that scene uh very well shot scene that is and there's another um scene um where she's sort of freaking out and the camera's in front of her and it's pivoting like to the left and to the right like in front of her face and i'm like wow that's really cool for 71 right yeah, Martino definitely was not afraid to experiment with the camera. Now, there's some really good shots, man. Like the scene where she's trapped in the vehicle in the parking garage and she looks over and you just see that, you know, that dark shadow and stuff. It might seem a little bit cliche to some people, but it's a really good shot because it, it, it hides them perfectly and it's nice and clear. And it's just the way it's angled is, oh, man, it's just it's really good cinematography, man. It catches it re- very well for what it's doing I, in, that, in that lighting. 
I think it's this movie. It might be all the colors. Like uh, they're, I watched them all very close together. So yeah, I'm, it, I'm it, they do run, run a little bit when you got the same fucking yeah. people in them. But there's a shot that's like so like claustrophobic, like going down a staircase where it's like pointing directly up, and you see her run down it, and it just like it gives this you like this like this real nauseating, uncomfortable feeling, and then she just like runs past you, and like it like the camera ends with her basically stepping on the camera, and it was just like little things like that add so much texture to a scene that could have just been shot completely different way right right <clears throat> yeah um oh man yeah there's there's sometimes they're so hard to to talk about without giving every little detail because i mean you know i feel like some people still haven't completely seen these and yeah i mean these aren't the most uh the most popular movies <laughs> not not exactly not exactly yeah. Um, but I just, you know, this one right here, man, it, it never, it ceases, it doesn't cease to amaze me. Like, you know, when the, when everything kind of, uh, unravels itself and, you know, I, I just think it's just such a well executed story. And I still, think, <laughs> I still think when you get all these fucking twists and turns towards the end, you know, with, with George and Neil and stuff like that. And I still think the end of this movie is so fucking funny and they, they should have somehow had dummies maybe floating in the river after or something like that, <laughs> you know, oh, because the, the, the flip had me laughing out loud. It, it, it just comes up and it happens. It's hilarious. It's, you know what fucking makes me laugh every time. So like they're fucking, they're literally, they're literally laughing like schoolboys. In the, yeah, like, on the, in the road and they're doing s's and they're just fucking around and then all of a sudden the shit doesn't go exactly as the plan and then all of a sudden they're like heading over a cliff <laughs> <laughs> it just fucking kills me man it's just so funny it's because so they're, goofy they're, they're, exactly and the funny thing is this movie's not it doesn't really have any comedy in it but that whole scene just seems so goofy because like they're literally laughing like schoolboys. <laughs> like they're just we got away with this shit and they're doing s's and oh man i mean just the name nature of their plan and like everything going on is like slightly homoerotic like the right. way you look at it, it does feel oh. like that a little bit it does it does actually <laughs> maybe there was a little bit more in the movie that got cut out that like elaborated a little bit but i don't think so because that would have just like ruined the whole movie <laughs> but <laughs> oh man oh dude that whole fucking end sequence is just it's so funny it's so funny but it's so fitting though right because you know it's, it's very italian it is so italian man it really is i mean that's the thing with like a lot of italian films is they really like to have that scene where people are either getting tossed off of buildings or falling off buildings or over cliffs and shit it happens a lot like even in the first I've definitely film, yeah it's like they love the cliff scenes they love <laughs> the the uh you know whatever it may be buildings and dummies and shit. oh my god I've definitely seen more 70s italian like italian dummy deaths than like any other like sub genre <laughs> film Oh man, it, it never, it, it always kills me, man. It always kills oh, me. People are always like confused why I laugh so hard, but it's like scenes like this though. Like, like I said, it would have been the funniest thing ever if you had dummies floating in the water after, <laughs> yeah, like, could you imagine just these loose the arms and these legs all twisted up and shit and they're going down the fast current? <laughs> been hilarious. <laughs> it would have been fucking ridiculous, man. I, you're uh, supposed to laugh. It's part of the charm. It it's really is, man. Yeah. And it, it is funny too, because like, it's just kind of an unexpected ending. Well, not not really them going over the cliff kind of thing, but just the way it transpires into that. Considering this movie is like pretty fucking dead serious. Like it's got a lot of twists and turns. It's got a lot of like kind of tension to it and stuff. And, and people are getting knocked off. And and then you got the S's in the road followed by cliff diving. It's yeah hilarious. He's definitely very good at creating tension in this movie without like without any specific like narrative writing he creates a lot of attention just by like these close-up shots like we were talking about with edgewick these situations of like with like voyeurism that he has peppered in just right. the way he, he goes like off script and it's very like whimsical and dreamlike and it just like it creates almost like an uncomfortable atmosphere you know there's even scenes too where they try to stage um uh julia's death by killing her through the carbon monoxide poisoning you yeah. know, using the ice cube on the lock and stuff. And, you know, some people are like, oh, yeah, whatever. But, like, that could actually work, you know, to get that lock. It, it, it possibly yeah. could fucking work. 
but I mean, even to go as far as okay, well, she lives, and then we're gonna we're gonna get it out there that she's actually di- died and stuff like that. Like they they took the point of actually you know putting that into the narrative and shit like that and making things make sense. Because again, there's there's certain giallos where they kind of forget these these key details, <laughs> you know, in the yeah, narratives, yeah. and you're like, what the fuck is going on here? So, yeah, there's some giallos that absolutely don't make sense. You kind of just roll with it, but like yeah. I, I think he does a pretty fine job, like even keeping this one pretty in line and yeah and keeping it within a a decent you know like a length of time too like this one's around 100 minutes i believe or something like that there's a lot of fucking progressive plot in this film there's so much going on all the time like there's really never there's really never any downtime and like i said like basically in the second half like the second half of this movie there's just nothing but plot twists and turns and things and characters that are coming and going and just nutty things that are happening and like it's just you know, I think that's one thing that plagues a lot of giallos is um, the pacing in the movie. Sometimes, like you will have a movie start with a bang, some kills, and then it'll get into the the procedural and you know the investigative report part, and they'll they'll kind of forget about building tension and you know creating you know those type of scenes. And this one, yeah. I mean, Martino just happens to do this in all his films. He really keeps everything interesting all the time, and uh, this is a great example of a film that. Uh, that definitely has good pacing for a hundred. Yeah. All the films are like, yeah, they're all like 95 minutes or so. So it's like, none of the films really overstay their welcome. No. Yeah. They really don't. <clears throat> um, you guys have anything else? There's one thing that had me cracking up on this, that like, I won't be able to watch this part. Like these parts without laughing, the scenes that they lifted and put in the editor and like hammed up of like her sex fantasies. Oh, right. <laughs> 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 like any time I see those now, I just die because all I can see is the editor. And just, it's fucking hilarious. <laughs> it is so funny. I know when I try to explain this to people, like Dave's not a big fan of the editor because he's like, it's too comical. I'm like, that's the point. You yeah, know, that's the point. They're like, parodying like a- these funny or these scenes from these movies. Like, and that's what makes the editor so much better is if you've seen all these type of movie, if you've seen this, the movies. Yeah, like, I've seen watched- the majority of it. I hadn't yeah. seen this movie the first time I saw the editor, but like, I definitely pulled it out right away. And like, right. it just makes it extra funny. But there's like plenty of stuff from like a little bit more obscure GLs in the editor that. Maybe yeah. some other people miss that I was dying. <laughs> and and that's where it's clever too from Astron Six with a lot of those scenes because they make it like super clever and funny. I mean, it might come off goofy to some people, but again, if you've seen the movies, it's it's very clever. It's very yeah, clever it's like, in how they did the shit. They're paying homage to it. It's, it's hilarious. Exactly. Yeah. So um yeah, but uh that's pretty much all I have on the strange vice of Miss Ward. Um without giving every little last detail away <laughs> talked about the ice cube on the door lock i mean really going there so um what do you guys got who goes first uh we'll start with uh tyler all right i'll break the ice uh yeah i think this movie's pretty good uh it's got some unique stuff to it i don't think it's incredible i think it still has you know it's got it's got some stuff that's a little clunky it's still not like like, it's not perfect or anything, but it's very good. I think it's something that should be in like the Giallo canon. I would give this movie a strong seven and a half. Wow. All right. Um, so I think this is a damn good Giallo. I, I think it's one of my favorites now in this first time watch. Um, I just love everything about it from the, the, the three boyfriends to the you know, le- left hand turn that you're not expecting. And then the honestly very comical ending. It's not like played for comedy necessarily, but it just comes off that way. Um, I, I re and, and dude, Edward is like the best in this movie for me. Um, I think this is the best Edward's movie for sure. I just, the, the, for some reason, this one just, it, she just is amazing. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I'm coming in at a eight and a half out of 10 on this one. Absolutely love this one. Yeah. Th- this one right here has always been uh, a personal favorite of mine, man. I love the narrative. I love the, the casting in this movie. It's just great, man. Hilton Fennec, you know, Rashford, um, is so many fucking awesome faces in this, but it's the twists and turns that really sells it to me, man. I love the fact that like, like you're watching this sex maniac killer just slash people up and all of a sudden it's like oh what the fuck 
Like that's the great one of the greatest <laughs> what the fuck moments ever. You're like, oh shit. And then the whole movie like takes this turn and you're like, oh shit. And then it just and then it just does Especially what it does. Especially if you've seen a bunch of giallos, because you never expect the killer to just be like, uh, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And then like how everything ties in and oh man, it's it's just it's just so well done. It really is so well done. Um, one of my favorites, the music is great in this one. I think uh cinematography is fantastic. Like we talked about the pacing, like there's just really nothing wrong with this one. I think it's uh it's a standout for me, man. Um, nine out of ten for myself on this one, so and uh yeah so that's gonna be the strange vice of miss wart from 1971. the case of the scorpion's tail all right so moving into the second featured review here also from 1971 released three days later according to indb august 16th 1971 the case of the scorpion's tail yes um great Not title to be confused with the scorpion with two tails yeah that was a later uh martino film i believe from the early 80s i've actually only ever seen that movie once i have like a really shitty dvd of it so i do know it's getting what a full moon blu-ray is coming out soon i believe is it? yeah i think full, i think full moon is the one releasing the the blu-ray <laughs> which is so randomly odd but that's it, very random it is but yeah it's about time it finally gets uh, a decent release yeah because my dvd is like it fuck it the transfer sucks on it i believe from what i remember so um but yeah, this one also starred in George Hilton. We got Anita Streisberg in this one, the beautiful Anita Streisberg. Uh, Tom Felgey, man, that's the dude that's on my on my fucking uh, letterbox. Who's like, I have like nineteen or twenty movies watched with this guy. He plays the insurance <laughs> adjuster, I believe. He always shows up in every fucking movie, like for small parts and shit. It's he plays Mr. Brenton. It's hilarious. Um, and then uh, we got Evelyn Stewart's in this movie. Um, Luigi Pastilli is also in this film. Like, like all these. Fucking Albert D. Mandillas is in this one. Yeah, a lot of names that we recognize. All right, so quick synopsis. When the estranged widow of a millionaire receives a massive payout following his death, an insurance investigator works to determine any irregularities, irregularities in the policy, but soon finds himself suspected of murder. That's, I guess that kind of works. Um, so, yeah, so what's... It's not Anita Streisberg. I think it's Lisa Brimer. Is it Lisa? No. Is she? Yeah, no, it is her. Yeah, no. So, yeah, she also has a different name. What does she also go by? Oh, Evelyn Stewart. That's her, like, American name. Oh, yeah, yeah. It came up, like, I remember that came up in the... Right. I I kept looking at it going because it has it written down in two different names. I'm like, something's off here. But Ida uh, Gialli, or Gialli? Yeah who plays Lisa Brimer or whatever, but, um, dude, I gotta say though, man, like this, this movie's, this is a really great movie too, but it starts out so fucking hilarious, like unintentionally funny. So <laughs> we get this like ridiculous, like miniature model airplane that essentially blows up and kills this, uh, this husband. Right. Um, and that's how the whole movie starts out. <laughs> You guys got to admit that shit is like ridiculous, right? Yeah. (laughs) It's like the, it gets me every time because I always forget and I'm like, oh my God, that, that model miniature airplane looks so bad. So yeah, that's, that's how our movie starts out. Like basically this, this guy, this rich dude's on a, on an airplane. It's uh, it blows up. It literally blows up. And the wife, she inherits uh, this million dollar insurance payout and stuff like that. And which in steps uh, George Hilton's character, who is a insurance investigator and stuff. And his his deal is that he's got to he's got to investigate like all these kind of big, high dollar amount insurance and stuff like that to make sure it's all on the level and shit like that. Anyways, uh, but before she really gets a chance to inv- to enjoy the money and stuff like that, she is actually murdered herself and uh, the money is stolen. So. Yeah, because she gets that bitch out in, in bills, bro. <laughs> yeah, man. She yeah. fucking she takes that million dollars out in, in, in bills and then uh she gets viciously viciously killed, she, actually. What, she's in another place and she wants to cash a check and take it back home or something, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I like think she, she knows something's bad's coming her way and she's trying to get away with her money before someone yeah, else. So that, so that's kind of an interesting plot twist in the beginning of the film because you're not really expecting, you know, what you think is our lead 
uh, female to get knocked off in like the first 20 minutes of the film. And she dies pretty nasty too, man. Like she gets fucking gutted and throat slit yeah, and shit. It's pretty nasty. He definitely amps up the kills in this movie. Yeah. 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 Um, that it's this movie. I'm not as head over heels on this movie as the other two, but uh, this movie starts out like really strong. And I wish they utilized that string score a little more. That score slaps so hard. And, like I was so on board when like you have that opening shot of her just walking down the sidewalk, like swinging her hips, and that string score is playing. I was like, this, yeah, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Right, right. Yeah, it's actually like the, the score in this film, I feel like is a little bit repetitive and it works at certain scenes and stuff. But at times, yeah. like it's it's not my favorite. Um, uh, uh, blah, 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 what's his name? Uh, Nicole, Nicole, uh, Bruno, Bruno Nic- Nicolai. Nicolai. Jesus, man. I Nicolai. can't. Nicolai. Nicolai. Yeah, this one, Nicolai. this one's almost got got two scores. I know what you're talking about. I like the string one much better. I think yeah, yeah. Stronger. Right. There's points in the Dude. there's points in the scores that are really good and stuff. But yeah, his Nic- Nicali's fucking score in uh, All Colors of the Dark is just like ridiculously good. Yeah. It's yeah. So, I think it was it's a lot uh, darker. This one definitely plays to to more of the tone of the film, which is, you know, it's in the day, it's not as like dark it's not as satanic for one thing <laughs> you know the score, the score makes a lot more sense for colors of the it's dark not given what Mary's well because yeah because we're you know we're kind of you know fighting the line between reality and non-reality and stuff so the score is a little bit different but yeah th- i feel like this one at times it's just i don't know it, it it's just kind of standard to me it's one of my least favorites i've ever heard of actually by him to be honest but this yeah. is i think this might have been the damn movie that i fell asleep watching the first time i tried to watch it and the fucking dv you know how i'm sure you guys have done this but the fucking menu plays over and fucking over again and you're like dreaming of that the whole time yeah right. especially if you got the arrow release the arrow arrow movies are always good that, for that. is the release that i have <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i actually have the severance for the other two and the arrow for this one so I actually owned all these yeah, I own them all too. It's like complete collector's vindication, owning all the movies. <laughs> yeah, these but days yeah. it's not too often that I don't have any of the Italian, unless unless we're picking some crazy obscure director. Just, that, just fuck. Just think about this though, bro. Ten years ago, when we started this shit, right, or mm-hmm. nine years ago, think of all these movies that we've covered in the last nine years, and think of how many weren't on Blu-ray when we started that so many right. more numbers we for the there. italian stuff dude it's insane well that's what we were discussing i think last week about Where next we? year's I show i remember if we were discussing well that just the fact that like next year because we picked four first-time directors and like all the movies are pro- like they're all really good. i think there's only one movie i haven't seen but i know f- from my personal experience that they're all good but like we couldn't have done that even a few years ago because some of those movies just like had no releases you know, it's just getting it's insane. Point, it's getting to the point now where like it doesn't even really matter who we pick or what we're doing. We can probably there's probably a good physical release out there from one of our uh, our beloved uh, boutique labels, which is crazy. Like, yeah. totally. I think cool. there's gonna be a lot of films in the next couple of years that like get reappraised or like come out of the woodwork and horror because now they're getting all these releases and people are seeing them and a lot of these classics that held like mythical status, people are also seeing and like like dwelling on a little bit more i think it's gonna be really interesting like to see how this like affects like the with the popular like zeitgeist of movies going forward and to sort of just uh pivot one more time here something that also kind of got me excited is what they did with uh new york ninja knowing that something like that's possible now to do oh yeah that's really cool you, you know to t- sort of take unfinished yeah. films and sort of finish them in a way yeah. i'm not sure how many would be out there but it's an interesting thought Oh, there's yeah. probably so many movies that just are sitting and filmed reels and that's it. You know, <laughs> no sound, no nothing. Like, yeah, I, never- it seems like it must have been like way more common back then because you had to buy all this film and you had to pay a lab to process it and then you had to go and cut it out on a table. Like you can't just <laughs> Not like- to mention that, but some of these studios will would start a film and then go under, you know, during the yeah, editing yeah. process and just Absolutely. cancel everything. Yeah, right. it's not like some guy can like take their memory card yeah. home now and put it on their Mac and throw it sure. at the movie maker. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So, what are your guys' thoughts on the film? Um, I always, I've always really enjoyed this one. I just feel 
and I've even again watching it last night, I feel like the way the narrative progresses itself into this one, I always feel like it goes exactly where you think it's going to go. I mean, obviously that doesn't really make it, obviously it's going to go be, where you think it's going to go if you've seen it before. <laughs> the fuck am I talking about? But even like, <laughs> but even, the, but you know, what is that going to change? What the narrative is going to change the second time I watch it? No, no, I, mean, I, I, I remember watching this years ago on a DVD and being like, okay, so just the way, like this one is a lot differently written than um, the previous film. Um, yeah. And I feel like just given, you know, the amount of people and suspects in this one and stuff, um, like it kind of ends up where it probably was going from the start. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't have that big, big surprises. Um, maybe there's like one little plot to twist in there with another character that's working with someone um, that used to always kind of get me going too, because there's a scene where, you know, if, if you think one person is doing the killing, like if you think of Peter's the killer in this film, um, there's a scene where, you know, he's actually at the front desk at the, he's talking to the con the concierge and, um, someone gets attacked in the room and it obviously can't be him and stuff like that. So it kind of, it kind of, you know, obviously sets you off on a little different area right there and stuff like that. But I feel like for the most part, this one kind of is, it's still really good in what it does, but it still ends up where I always thought it was going to be heading do you guys know what i mean without giving too much away like i, I feel like this one doesn't have yeah. you know the, the big left turns and, and you know the big twists and turns and stuff like that and yeah like, even though it does have reveals where you're like oh okay now that part makes sense because this person was you yeah. know dealing with them and stuff and there's actually one scene in this film where a dude does get his eye gouged out and shit. and at the point of that kill you're like who the fuck is this dude yeah that part's <laughs> brutal with the bottle yeah yeah but then it, it yeah, explains awesome. it, it explains why that dude gets killed a little bit later but that scene yeah. when it happens you're like oh okay and then it gets it gets explained a little bit later okay that's why that dude got killed because really like at that point in the film you're like why is this guy being killed <laughs> like what yeah. the fuck? but yeah. you know otherwise man i think it's i think it's um it's it's entertaining throughout the whole film and i think again you know george hilton being cast in this film as you know an insurance investigator and stuff he's just cast perfectly and i think anita streisberg is fuck, she's awesome this do you, do you know who she is jp anita streisberg she's actually the she's basically the victim i've seen her before well she well just recently we just recently reviewed a film with her in it okay that's why i, see, I guess i've seen her before then. yeah in uh lizard woman skin she's she's the one that gets killed in the beginning of the film on the bed gotcha gotcha yeah yeah, yeah right yeah. so that's why i mentioned that but anyways yeah so but anyway she gets like a full star oh movie. she's in your vice is a, that's where i'm thinking of her from your vice yeah yeah, yeah, she's, the yeah, wife, yeah, yeah. she's the wife right and your vice? Yeah, yeah 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 she's also in that but yeah i was just saying because we just recently yeah, did yeah. Fulci's film but yeah well, she's a little bit smaller part in that one because she really dies at the beginning of the movie so <laughs> but yeah well, i know she yeah, well, she's, is just like so beautiful in that movie that you just like tunnel vision on her right yeah but i think this movie's good but um it feels like less mark like less of a martino movie than, than a lot of his other ones um it doesn't really have that like escapism like almost uh like dreamlike feeling i think that they want that the other ones have i think this one feels a little more grounded um i think it's got just as many twists if not more it just really seems like the red herring tag of the movie but um, they're not as far as a left turn, like you were saying. Like they're all like way more ground. Well, th this one turn. to me has kind of those standard kind of you know twists exactly. and turns that every GL is going to have. But like, I mean, it's just it, you know when you when you when you when the movie ends or when the reveal happens to like who's doing all this shit and stuff, you kind of think back on the film. You're like, okay, you know, it, it feels yeah, like exactly. it feels like A to B, like a, a lot of it because you know there's so like I mean literally the red herring is the red herring. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, yeah. you know, it's so, it's so interestingly different than, than, uh, you know, strange vice and war, you know, twist and turn wise and narrative wise and stuff. But, yeah. you know, I mean, I still think this one has some really good kills. It's got some really good points to it and stuff. Um, yeah, but it's, it, it's, it's a totally better. different feel. It's a, oh yeah. Yeah. The bottle and the eye man. Oh man. That's and the, awesome. The gutting, the gutting of, um, of, uh, Lisa is brutal man in this film too yep she gets fucked that's a nasty kill dude like you really don't even have to do that you're gonna gut her and then fucking slit her throat and shit that's crazy but but yeah 
Yeah, I think this one's got a little bit more downtime than the other ones too. Like there's more scenes. There, you know what there is? Out. It's a lot Sorry. more procedural. That's that's yeah. the thing. There's so much. There's a lot of police. And, and you know the nice thing about this movie too, like you know the, the interactions between George Hilton's character and of course um, Anita Streisberg and the police and stuff. Like there's a ton of scenes in this film with them, you know, doing the procedural type stuff. Um, at least the cops in the film aren't fucking morons. You know, it's one thing about this yeah. film that I actually do like because they don't portray the cops as being idiots. They're actually very progressive. They're they're still working through things and, and they're not treated as morons and stuff. And then and then actually when, you know, the cops basically kind of figure out what the hell's going on and stuff, it it you know, at least it does make sense, you know, as to like yeah, how they do like stuff. It's yeah, the cops the cops make the break and like they have to and they do connect things that mm-hmm. kind of does make them the hero. Yeah, I, there's nothing worse than watching these giallos where the cops are like, oh my God, you're like, they're, they're absolutely fucking, useless. Like, the worst <laughs> characters in the movie. And you're like, you can't, it, it's hard to get into those films when the cops are so stupid. Yeah. Right. Like you just can't do like, they're the ones that are so, supposed to be progressing this the narrative and, you know, figuring things out and unfolding the mystery and stuff. And you're like, no, this dude's like, all he can think about is going home and eating craft dinner and shit. He's an idiot. You know, it's yeah, like, movies in general, I think I tend to struggle when they just have characters that are outlandishly stupid for no reason. It just like feels lazy to me. Right. Right. Yeah. Um one thing that I really like, I don't it might have been said, but I was looking at pictures of Edwidge, so I might have not been paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I was trying to find if I could find he's a trying to he's trying to find a still of that uh that I want, scene with I her want George a poster Hilton. of her, man, on my wall or something. <laughs> Um, but I think Tom does. I think Horseball has a, he? has a frame poster in, a, in his uh, house. Smart, yeah. smart man. Yeah. What a fucking um, legend. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the scene in the dark room and then uh, with the red lighting, love stuff like that. And then yeah. um, the, and then there's like a green lighting scene. I think it just follows that one. And I like that as well, which anytime. And I, that's what I love about like 70s cinema and especially Italian stuff is they were doing a lot of fun stuff with colors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that you didn't really get that much in American cinema unless it was set in like New York or something like that, and you would get a lot of the or you know like a lot of the big cities with the neon lights and stuff. You get some of that, but um, yeah, I thought that was cool. Um, I, I I actually really liked this one as well. Uh, I don't think it's as like it, it's see. I feel like if you watch like I watched this one first. So I feel like if I would have watched this like after, like in the order that we're reviewing them, I think I would have probably been a little more disappointed in this one coming yeah, from I watched the previous it one. That order. But this is the first one I watched and I was like, man, that was pretty solid yellow too. Right. Yeah. The thing is for me too, and this just might be like subconscious bias. Like I went into the other two movies, like knowing I already like these movies and like this one, like, I was kind of in the middle about, I only had seen it once before and like, it didn't really register much for me as memorable. So I think I was already approaching that as like, not as the same attitude I was with the other two movies, but I like Martino. I like all his movies. So I wasn't like, I was, I don't think it's a bad movie or anything. I think it's definitely a good movie. Right. Yeah. I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually a really big fan of this one and you know, to where it kind of ends up on a boat. Come on, man. You know, me in boats and shit. It's fucking awesome. The boats is, I think, where the score like works. What works the best is like the score feels to me is like it's trying to like portray like a feeling of like liberation, and it's like very like liberating towards like women. And this week, he actually like that's something I kind of just noticed. Like a lot of his movies, a lot of the Martino movies, like focus on strong women as opposed to some of the other stuff at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Like yeah, some of the cinematography of like the big shots of like them on the boat and the scores just cranking as she's like on the bow of the ship. Like that's that's some good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, it's an oddball part in this film when George Hilton and Anita Streisberg are um, they're having dinner, and she's like, "How's it taste?" She's like, "More paprika," and he like pulls out <laughs> the whole fucking paprika shaker. <laughs> fucking out of the pot i'm like what the fuck like why is that in the movie you guys remember that they probably ran out of film i do not remember that (laughs) they're literally they're they're having dinner and she's like she's like more paprika and then he like pull like the whole paprika shaker is in the fucking sauce i don't think anybody's ever offered me more paprika that's a weird thing to have on the table 
it's just such a weird thing that it's like in the pot though like why is yeah. like, <laughs> the movie has no comedic elements except for this one ridiculous goofy part it's kind of like miss worth with the fucking car crash at the end i almost feel like sergio was just like ah we nah, just take the shot we're not spending any more film on this right yeah i don't know man it, it's just it's so out of place though too but it's it's kind of it's just quirky in itself it's strange <laughs> but like it's got vicious kills and the, the whole thing is serious and you're like more paprika what <laughs> yeah the kills in this movie are definitely good the like, case of the pot and the paprika yeah that's a general title that for you for you there it's <laughs> fucking weird man <laughs> oh man yeah i mean <sighs> You know, I mean, the whole thing with the cufflings and, and the scorpion's tail and stuff, like, I mean, I mean, it's got to end up somewhere. It's called The Case of Scorpion's Tail. It's got a very classic Giallo wrap up. Right. Yeah, it really isn't does. There a li- isn't there a line in this movie, too, where, like, she's like, don't you, maybe you remember overhearing something. And I laughed, like, so loud at that. <laughs> like, that's, like, the plot to every fucking Giallo. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I remember this now. Yeah, yeah, they don't they don't fucking hesitate at the end of this movie either. You know, they they just fucking, you know, automatic that shit, man. Crazy. Oh. Um but again, you know, Hilton, he's a piece of shit in two movies. Pretty it's awesome. It's almost like a typecast. Yep. <sighs> yeah. Oh, I don't. I don't really know what to say without giving the whole damn thing away. That's the thing <laughs> yeah, with this, this one. This movie is like literally like they show you the like the first twist, like like you said, is her getting killed right away because you think she's going to be the main character. Like, yeah, she never gets. She, I think she was going to Tokyo. I think that's where she was going. She was taking the money out to go to Tokyo. I think. Yeah, or, like you. She regardless, like you think she's going to be the main character. Like right. this movie's going to be about her, and then she dies, and it's just like it's almost like the hot potato of like you're the killer. No, no, I guess not. It's mm-hmm. just like he's swapping the whole movie, so it's kind of hard to talk about playing like, oh, this person got killed, and then well, it's also be- it, it's also because this one's so procedural too. Yeah, right? there's so much dialogue, there's so much energy spent into the George Hilton character, Anita Streisberg, and the police and stuff, right? I mean, there's obviously scenes that are happening, but like when you have like your main character investigating um, the whole movie and and then have it go where it goes, you're like, okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right like what do you say what do you say hmm. but i wonder if there's a different writer used it looks like he didn't write any of these movies i wonder mm. if there's just like the same writer on the other two and that's why it feels a little different oh yeah I don't know, dude. yeah yeah because they, they dubbed the killer in this one the sex the sex maniac killer also which is so funny that they use that in two straight movies it's just so fucking cliche too it's so funny that's that's tyler's nickname the sex the sex maniac the sex maniac killer the sex maniac right. killer it's so funny um but yeah no i i mean i still really i still really enjoy this movie i think it's pretty decent for what it is kills are good all right um i guess i will go first yeah show uh yeah i think kills are pretty good um i think that the uh there's some good cinematography lighting stuff that i really like um it's a little bit more simple compared to the other one it it doesn't have huge crazy twists and stuff but i still think it's like a very easy to follow like enjoyable giallo that it's the thing things that giallo's do to like annoy me is if they're too damn slow with too much um police procedural that just feels like it's going in circles and nowhere um it, it, it doesn't really have that and uh that's that's a huge plus for me and then ones that literally make zero sense are the other ones that i don't like and it doesn't it's not that either uh i'm gonna give it a seven and a half out of ten <laughs> Yeah, like Martino, these movies are, they almost feel like body count films too. There's, there's a lot of deaths in these, you know, like I think there's what, six or seven kills in this film. And there's probably about the same in the first film too, which, you know, in theory, like there's a lot of giallos that 
sometimes don't even have half that like there'll be a killer you know killer two like that and then they'll just go into street procedural and stuff but i think that's what kind of separates his movies a little bit man they're they feel like they're fucking body count films uh, which is not a bad thing because to me it just feels like you know proto slasher type films too there there's just a lot of elements here that are obviously you know kind of um taken from these films and later put into our beloved 80 slashers and stuff but i don't know uh, they, they, these think, ones just they just feel different they feel different than a lot of other giallos i, I think 80 slashers really took a lot from these movies yeah i i think specifically like maybe some of these martino films and stuff i mean you look at the way they're the way they're you know being portrayed on the screen and stuff like they're if someone called these a slasher film i wouldn't even be you know it, it, i'd be like okay well it's just you know it's it's definitely a little bit more on the slasher than than your typical you know procedural giallo and stuff where there's one or two kills and stuff like that and then you get a lot of pointless narrative and and then a reveal that probably doesn't make sense at the end <laughs> but again these ones are just different you know great plots and you know twists and turns with a high body count great kills and um and they make fucking sense that's what really that really makes sense or that, that really helps with these type of films and again with this one too like i like the procedural stuff when it makes sense and you know when the cops figure out the whole scorpions like the cuffling and things like that i think that's uh, i think it all works really well again casted really well george hilton's fantastic as you know the the playboy face that's a fucking dick in real life um <laughs> but you know it's just it it's it's just entertaining i feel like you know both these movies when i watched them back to back last night they just rip by like rip by so again the, the pacing is great again in this even though it's done a lot differently than the one before and i don't want to like you know do a direct comparison it's kind of hard not to and it's, it's kind of hard not to compare yeah these movies. because they they are martino but you know they're completely different narratives but you know the the point is is that the pacing is really good and that really fucking helps with these type of movies so um i'm coming in at uh eight out of ten on this one i i really like it okay. Tyler. Yeah. like i said i'm not I'm not head over heels in love with this movie. I think it's a good movie. I think it's definitely worth respect. Like I think it's worth it to explore just most of these stronger directors. Martino being one of them. Um, of like the five films I've seen by Martino, I think this is his weakest one for me. Uh, this might seem a little low, but I, this is considered just like a good movie, but not a great movie. I would give this like a strong six and a half. Yeah, I know that in general, some of the audience might not know, but Tyler um rates a little um stricter than a lot of people in general like you don't give a lot of you know tens or yeah um, like just ratings. yeah like just like a for me like a six is a good score i know like that seems like an insult for like a lot of movies but that's really not i don't even think like a five is a horrible score i think a five is like it's not great but it's not bad um but like i don't give tens to movies unless i feel like it's like best of all time like transcended experience like i, I like to i kind of but i also don't rate stuff like threes like twos because i think like a lot of movies that like get those scores are like overblown and like there's like way more merit to it than like having it be that low it's like the worst of the worst mm-hmm. right man you know yeah. what i say it all the time ratings are for dummies i say it all the yeah. time ratings are for dummies man because it really is just a fun point to throw on to the end result of the review you know, you gives, know what it, it, it gives something people to talk <laughs> about it gives something people to bitch about complain and at the end of the day i'm like i, I mean everyone's you know fives and sixes and sevens are based on a different rating scale and, and it, also yeah, it doesn't really matter at the end mine of the day. change fucking constantly me too man me too like, it, <laughs> like honestly, constantly man. bro like i gave um all the colors uh I think like six the first time i seen it and i'll tell you where i came in this time but you know <laughs> they, they change and that, all the time right? and was that for the 72 show uh yeah i think so 72 yeah i think i i, I actually i might have got that as a patreon pick mm. but i might have might have been during the 72 prep so i think it killed two birds one stone type thing mm-hmm. someone was being polite probably you <laughs> i actually like that like i actually liked that movie especially back then like i liked this movie that movie a lot 
I remember yeah. like for that 70, I watched it because of that 72 show and I liked it so much. That I knew it was going to make my top 10 that I watched it again. Yeah. Right. All right. So that is the case of the Scorpion's Tale from 1971. Once you have seen this film, every time you turn on your light, you will turn on all the colors of the dark. All right. So getting into the third and final film here on Martino 2 from 1972, All the Colors of the Dark. Do you remember how many people, if any, had it in their top 10? I think I, I think I've had this in my top 10 from 1972. I think you were the only one because I was really invested in that show because I watched like 25 of these movies because I just got to knock out a bunch of giallo that I hadn't seen. Right. And I remember being like, all these boots had all the colors in the dark and being like a little butthurt over it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that tends to happen sometimes. I mean, I have the list here, so I'll look. Um, yeah. I know, so, I know Brandon's number one, I believe was my dear killer. It was, a, it, it was my dear killer and like nobody else like had it on their list. Well, you know what? I fucked up. I fucked up on my list because I love that movie and I think I just forgot to put it on my list. I don't know if I mentioned that in the show or whatever, but I've talked, I even have that in videos in top yeah. 10 lists, my dear killer. Cause I had, I have like the old shameless DVD and well, it came out on Blu-ray now. I have that too, but, but I, I, I just like, I think it was an over, I think I just overlooked it because I'm yeah. like, Oh, that's fucked it. Cause I honestly, I've talked about how much the opening kill in that movie makes me fucking laugh. It's literally so fucking funny. Do you remember what the opening kill is with the huge like bulldozer? <laughs> I've actually never seen that one. <laughs> oh my god, the opening kill is one of the most ridiculous opening film kills of all time. It's so fucking ridiculous. It's awesome. It's amazing. It sets. It really does set the tone for the film. It's pretty yeah. good. Going but, back, I think yeah, you're the only one that had that mids. Really? Shit. Okay. Yeah. If I was trying to be honest and pick like what I thought is the best movie of 1972, going back, I probably would pick "Don't Torture a Duck." now as the which is what is, that was his number one yeah, yeah that, that I, was my favorite one yeah it's like i've never like looked at that movie as like one of my favorite movies but it's a movie i've gone back to like five or six times and especially like the last four years i've probably watched it at least once if it, i think what really what's important about that movie is if you put it into the context of the time and how Fulci really shouldn't have been making that movie it was very controversial yeah, you guys had a really good discussion on that movie. I hope some people like listen to it and maybe like they get like more of the textures of these films. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. thought our discussion was really good too. Yeah, that 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 really kind of heightens the the uh, the film, and, and it's a great film, and it has like the greatest dummy death ever in it. So I mean, all these yeah. things combined, <laughs> yeah. all these things combined, it's just it's a great. Experience. I was talking to someone someone yet yeah, last week about the movie Images, also from seventy two, and mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, and it has like the best fucking dummy death you'll ever see, but it's <laughs> still not the best one of that year. No, no. <laughs> I feel like actually, I, and Private Parts was from seventy two as well. I feel like yeah, Images might was right that right. on my top ten list too. What images? Yeah. Yeah, it was. That was very, very good. I must have had private parts. That's like all my top 10 right there. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I had, what what, what have high. you done to Solange? Yeah, um, you had that pretty high. That's a good movie. Sisters. Yeah. Sisters would probably be my one or two. Oh, yeah, that Sisters is great. Night of the Devil's Vampire Circus and The Night Stalker. Yeah. I think right. Duckling and probably Images, I think they're better than Sisters, but I, I love Sisters. Images is a trip, man. That's a good movie. Yeah. yeah, actually, Images did not make my top 10, and I really like that one. I think it was the guy, the guy that made Images is like a top 10 favorite director for me. I've seen like somewhere like 12. I just couldn't fit it in. I had to get Legend of Boggy Creek on there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, yeah, 1972 is All the Colors of the Dark. Quick synopsis. A woman recovering from a car accident in which she lost her unborn child finds herself pursued by a coven of devil worshippers. <laughs> well, what a different narrative that is. Sounding narrative. Yeah. That's, the other that's, that's a different one. You know, it's funny too, because like, you know, I'm reading this off INDB and in the first um genre that comes up on here is horror. It actually comes up as horror thriller. Satanic panic. Yeah, satanic panic before satanic panic was a thing um but yeah totally different type of movie like again this is martino doing a, a different style of film and a lot of people always dub this as like edward fenix like you know masterpiece in acting um it's just different it's a lot different it's you know she's 
she's beautiful. Yeah, very yeah. beautiful. In this. But, she, <laughs> but, she, but she has to do like a ton of acting in this movie because she's always like, is it reality? Is it is it not? Is it you know? Is it fake yeah. or real and stuff like that? So she's constantly in these modes of like turmoil through the whole fucking mm-hmm. movie. And I think Martino captures that very well. Like it has this kind of dreamscape atmosphere and tone to the film, mixed in with Nick Lottie's fucking uh, score, which is just ridiculous ridiculously catchy and awesome like yeah. the combination here cinematography and the narrative is really cool too but just the way she plays the character like you feel her pain like you're just like holy shit man like she's going through some fucking turmoil here uh mixed in with that score she has just, really good facial expression yeah she's very stuff. good at that right right yeah, and of course particularly and of course hey, this hey. one again has george hilton in it of course and uh, ivan rashavon is in this film where having some crazy ass eyes um you know what dave would say he would say they had passion in their eyes right right uh susan scott aka nevs navarro is in the film she plays um edward fennick's sister in the movie and she's fuck i i absolutely love her she's so damn beautiful i first saw her in like the ringo films back in the back back when i watched him in 1965. no i have i have the blu-ray but the pistol for ringo and the return for ringo not really my favorite spaghetti westerns but she's really awesome she's so beautiful in those movies i she's, actually have those too yeah she's, she's in, in the, another good she's in the big gun down she's in the big gun down oh, that movie fan- is dope yeah uh, like she's that. in audio sabata she's in the forbidden uh photos of a lady above Subish- suspicion yeah, death walks on high one. heels um yeah death so sweet so dead she's in midnight yep um she's in tons and tons of movies and she's like it's so cool that she plays edward fennick's sister in the film because they they kind of look like they could be sisters like legitimately fucking both hot yeah i can like yeah oh yeah totally um luciano pregosi's in the film like just it it never ends it never ends with people and um i think uh yeah tom felig he's in this film too he was in the last one he plays the inspector in this film like he's just everywhere um <laughs> like there's another guys. girl the one in there um what the fuck what's her name it's the girl that plays mary in this movie she's in a book she's on a good handful of giallo too she's oh. in the red queen yeah yeah she's in the red queen quill yeah she's in the red queen kill seven times which is that's a movie i like a lot i think that movie's really underrated i know i always tell that story about my fucking my compulsive collecting and i don't know if you've ever heard the story before but i wanted this movie for so long and i finally said "Fuck it i'm gonna grab the german dvd well the yeah. day i got it in the mail which was like two weeks later arrow announced yeah. the blu-ray <laughs> oh, oh no <laughs> it was literally the day i got it in the mail it was so <laughs> fucked that it was that two-pack Dude. man i was like are you fucking serious man so many people were just like bro like you have I, I, even gp was like bro you need patience so i'm like i know i know for fuck's <laughs> sakes i'm the worst yeah i know someone like a couple of months ago buys the night of the living dead blu-ray and then the very next day they announced the 4k <laughs> <laughs> right right yeah, yeah that's like the this, worst man this chick is in a lot of movies man she was in seven bloodstained orchids yeah uh, she was in the fourth victim which just came out from seven i actually had that as a i think i had that as a patreon pick a long time ago or did a review for that um yeah she's in a ton of movies without she was in without warning too crazy wow oh, that's that's a cool one i haven't seen that in a while 70 yeah it's the one from 73. um but yeah no like it's just you know these faces these faces that's what i love about this era of italian films it's like oh i know that person i know that person you, you feel like they're just family at this point you've seen so many damn movies with them in it so yeah like you like all these different actors you know meet people in different ones like we need another person for this smaller role i think i know someone they call someone up it's kind of like it, i feel like a lot of these lower budget movies that they were making like cranking out like just had to be made up of like friends oh 100 percent but it's it, it's like comfortability within you know directors and you know casting people too like i mean directors do this all the time they have the same actors and actresses in their oh, films yeah. because they, once they get comfortable working with them it's easier to direct those type of people too right oh, once you have yeah, a relationship sure. right instead of yeah, changing that's... up your cast all the time like why not just throw in fennec for this oh i have this part for you you'd be great for this oh yeah you know i, yeah, I trust exactly. your directing so yeah so it makes sense that's why i brought up to you earlier like it feels like this was the final movie like of all the collaborations they did because i just i just feel like there's like a much stronger like director actress connection in this where like they're more daring and they like try some different things and they go a little bit a little bit like more over the top than they did in a couple of the other movies than the other movies right right yeah i mean given the narrative in this one it's just it's such a different story compared to the ones he'd done previously and stuff and I, I really like this angle of taking you know this very dark kind of satanic angle and uh you know 
working around it with that and stuff. And it's funny because Hilton in this film is like a completely different type of character than we saw him in the previous two films, which also kind of adds to it too, because you're almost expecting him to turn yeah, out to be like... expecting him to be a bastard. Yeah, yeah <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's kind of an interesting, kind of an interesting uh, angle to the film too. So yeah, but, I really uh, like the, that route he took with it being dark. Um, one thing I really want to highlight about it, um, that I- I'm really impressed with the ingenuity he... Um, he put into this movie because it feels like he didn't have these vast locations like he did in the last two movies where he got to like really like use those mm-hmm. a lot of this stuff looks like it's shot on a sound stage and he did like such a good job of making these minimalist like real like dark room dream like nightmare sets that just burn into your fucking brain and like give you a lot to like think about and like it gives you a more of an arbitrary feeling with the film than just a straightforward narrative mm-hmm it's just really effective right right um gp what are your thoughts on the film since you know you you came in pretty low on this one before yeah honestly i didn't really remember it like i i don't remember watching it that much like i remember specific um like images like it, um whenever like the sect is like it's a pov of her and they're like all their hands are out like and stuff i that i remembered but I didn't really remember it. So watching it this time, I really appreciated just the different nature of it with the whole uh, like sect thing. And you, I feel like I was expecting just like a giallo or something, but it's it's really not. It's 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 very different. And um, I like the incorporation of like the 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 dreams and like what's reality, what's not, and um, you know, obviously. <laughs> my girl <laughs> is uh, a great lead in here as well but yeah I, I definitely enjoyed this one a lot more than i did the last time that i watched it which i bear how long ago did we do that show feels for like forever ago oh, 72 was a long time ago was yeah, I don't think even you, years back. i think you did it like three and a half years ago feels yeah, if, longer, it, it but, feels yeah i don't know because we've done so many top 10 shows i can't even i can't remember when we did them i know dude. like i just i can't even remember like the order now but i feel like I it feel wasn't like, even the last 70 show we did we did seven it's, it's definitely the last four years because i think yeah. i have it logged in my letterbox and i started that in 18 so if i have anything logged in there it has to be from 18 on yeah i think it was like may of 19 and i remember this because i moved into my house in the fall of 2018 and that's when i picked up collecting again so I remember like I had just like gotten back to the game and that was the current show. So I bought like a ton of like, I, it got me into buying a ton of Italian movies uh, from Arrow at the mm-hmm. time. Uh, it was episode 161. Wow. 160. And this is one or this is 231. Holy shit. Yeah. So that's like 40, 70. That's like 70 shows ago. Yeah. Wow. Damn, dude. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. You, you, I, you I, probably it's probably have completely different top tens now. Uh, it, it, mine it, wouldn't be that different, but it would be different. The thing is, though, like that's the thing with top ten shows is like over time you end up seeing films maybe pause. I mean, some, when we do these top ten shows, we go pretty in depth Deep, with. But there's the still of films stuff that, that comes watch. out that we didn't like, yeah, know every, about or like. Yeah, every once in a while, man, there's a film or something. Yeah, there's there's been films that have been released. I know on top ten lists that I never got a chance to watch that got physical releases and shit. I'm like, even Vinegar Syndrome would drop stuff, and I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? It's just crazy. Well, how even like the first year we did, like the seventies or the first year in the seventies, seventy six, even sixty eight, I remember not being able to find like good quality copies of a lot of the movies of that time, and even since then so much more has come out on oh Blu-ray man and stuff like that i think we talked about that too like i would love to actually just revisit 1968 and do a list again because you're right there was films that we couldn't see because the internet just wasn't the internet back then it was a little bit different it's so much easier and we didn't things. really take it as serious i think i only watched like 20 movies or yeah, something like that exactly too. i think i think you know it was probably about that for it was the too. first one we were just like <laughs> testing it out right right and then yeah that was the one that jeremy well, he did a top five right oh yeah. my god i said I remember Jeremy, that i was like at least watch 10 movies okay like freaking months go by yeah and <laughs> i'm like he did he he wasn't doing the show and i was like okay we'll just send your list in and i got five titles 
I was like, you know, it's a top ten, right? <laughs> Jesus Christ, sixty-eight's not like that bad of a game either. No, no it's, it's good. Sixty-eight is it actually has some pretty amazing. Well, it's got like, you know, if you want to work, if you want to talk about best movies of all time, it's got probably two of those. Yeah, you got Night, you got Rosemary, but just mm-hmm. like past the the gear, like the uh, the tears outside, you got Curran Nico, you got um, Mask of the Red Death, I think it is. Yeah, there's which is kind of crazy. That one doesn't make my. The plan. Devil Rides Out is a pretty decent movie. Good yep. movie. Yeah, targets. Tar- yeah, targets. Targets. Oh, oh. targets is. Nerve. I've wanted to see targets so bad. Yeah, I'm, I still have never seen it. I actually had the. Uh, I don't know who was releasing it. it. Was like second. Somebody in the UK was releasing the Blu-ray. Yeah. To come out, and it got canceled though recently. It's a so. Peter. It's a Peter Bogdanovich movie, and that's like so against the type of movies he usually makes. Yeah, he makes like like heartwarming like almost like sappy movies like man like i want to see this fucking like shooter movie <laughs> real bad hour of the wolf there there's a lot oh, of the hour of the wolf That's that is such that is such an under i feel like that movie is so underrated man this is crazy no one ever talks about that film it's crazy so yeah, i i think like a lot of people in horror just don't really like know who ingmar bergman is no, I mean, like for sure. yeah. for cinema. Well, not only Ingmar, Ingmar Bergman, like that era of films in general is slept on, and then yeah. add in somebody who's not making you know there, American films. And there's just you know, not, yeah. there's just not enough you know overall interest in the movies. Like you know, even break it down to like you know, even when I do like the Thirty One Days of Horror and stuff, like I try to do a film every year from the thirties up. Like I'll cover the thirties, forties, fifties, all the way to present. I'll do like a current two thousand twenty two film. But like, I can always tell before I post the video how it's going to do. And the ones, the older films always do shit like thirties, forties and fifties. And then they sometimes sixties, but it's like the seventies, eighties, nineties. And you know, everything basically from the seventies to current are the ones that always do well. Mm -hmm. There's just not enough interest in those older films. People just like, whatever the fuck is this, you know, and it's too bad. It's too bad because sometimes I'll like, I'll review a film from the thirties or forties and I'll be like, this is pretty fucking good. Actually. Like this is needs to be seen, but like no one's watching the review. It it sucks. Some people I talk to that are like, you know, like in the mold, like cinephiles will watch anything or like they claim to be at least like it's, it's a little sometimes it's even pulling teeth to get them to watch something like pre 60s and these are the people who are supposed to like love like love the cinema you know what i mean mm-hmm. right right yeah in fact um Karikino actually made my top 10 that year i can't even remember movie. what was on my list i honestly can't remember at all um i can tell you right now <laughs> uh, king kong escapes dracula has risen from the grave oh, yeah, corruption uh which finder general Rape of the oh, Vampire. Which Final General is pretty good. Yep. Hour of the Wolf, Twisted Nerve, Spider Baby, Night Living. Oh Night. my God. Spider Baby's a real okay. good movie. Okay. So that, that list is actually pretty decent. But yeah, it'd that's be, a it, good year. It would be interesting to see. Yeah. Just how it would shape up now. Like, I feel like King Kong Escapes probably wouldn't sneak in. No, no. It probably wouldn't <laughs> be on there. <laughs> but I feel like the like, top five or six on there might not be going anywhere. There's some pretty yeah, good films on there. Yeah. there there's yeah. some real strong movies. He's, yeah, like you just named. Yeah, um, but yeah, that was you know definitely got sidetracked there. Uh, getting back to um, all colors of the dark, um, not to yeah. be confused with all the colors of Giallo. Yes, that is the uh, the documentary. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, Fennec Man. Oof, this is definitely. I, I feel like this is one of those roles where like. I always remember her from because she's so involved in this one. You know, she's not just yeah. like, you know, the housewife or somebody's chasing her or something like that. She's, she's really, really the main focus in this one. So my, my question is, and things I've always had minor issues with this film is just the way everything, well, it's just, it's just kind of where it concludes and like where it, everything tries to add up and stuff, just how they, how they, they incorporate her past, like her mother's death in this film with, to what's happening with her, and you know with her sister and things like that like how do you guys feel about you know the when basically the way the way this one plays out yeah i think that's the the weakest part of the movie um it feels like at the end there's a giant exposition dump and it all doesn't really connect but this movie is like so stylistically strong 
and like so strong at like creating like almost like a not like some of the black mass stuff is so nauseating like and how effective yeah. they use the camera and the score yeah. like i almost like forgive it for those moments yeah like it's a not it's a knock on it but like that's not like what i love about this movie I, I think that my favorite things, which is kind of ironic for me to say, because people know how much I'm not really a big dreamscape type fan, like, you know, but unless it incorporates into the narrative in in a usable way like here, it makes kind of sense because she's involved with satanic stuff. She's having these visions, but we also understand that she's under duress and she has mental, she's having mental issues and things like that. So these kind of dream sequences and these things that are happening to her make sense to me. I hate like when you're watching a film and like, there's just a random dream sequence that pops out and yeah. you're like, Oh, for fuck's sakes, that was a fucking dream sequence. Come on. Unless the whole movie's about dreams or it's utilized like this. I think a lot of those scenes in the film make a lot of sense. I think performance is really good, but you're right though. The, the actual, um, the, the cult scenes and the orgy scenes and stuff are like, they're like the, the, the sex scenes and shit that, that's not sexy. It's like almost evil and nauseating. And the yeah. tone, the tone is so dark that it's almost, it, it almost makes your stomach turn a little bit because you also know that it's not really nothing good is coming of this either. So mm -hmm. it's not like even in the moment when you're watching one of the most beautiful women in the world, get her titties felt up and, and sexed up and shit. You're like, ah, yeah, dude. all it does is make me mad. They're touching my woman. I know, and, but it does a good job of what it's, what it's trying to do. And uh, yeah, I think those are the greatest scenes. I think Ivan Rochevon in the film is really good too. Um, he, he, he plays such a great villain, right? He just looks like one. He, he plays it off well. Um, yeah and stuff but i do feel the way this thing connects at the where the way they try to connect it up is the weakest part of the narrative because you know they they connect it with the mom's death and you know what her sister is doing and she you know she turns out that you know she's kind of involved or she's kind of the one leading the fucking charge in this this whole cult thing and stuff and i don't know man i think it's i think from a narrative perspective and writing perspective you know if we were to put all these things into the same bowl this is definitely the weakest one from that point from that standpoint mm -hmm. uh, don't get me wrong yeah. i think it's a very enjoyable watch i just don't think things connect the way they possibly should to make it yeah. like good good yeah like, i agree 100 percent. like the narrative it's the core narrative i like the setup i like, like the execution of of the you know the the a little bit of paranoia and mm -hmm. and sort of it, honestly very rosemary's baby i'm sure everybody's said that before right, but right um definitely feels that way uh but w in terms of like the other two films in term with when you're talking about um the actual like story from front to back the back end of this one definitely is not as strong as those two yeah i i definitely agree with both those sentiments it's just her motivations like her sister's motivations to why this is it just it seems so yeah. weak to me like it really yeah. th you're just like really that like that that's why this is all happening and shit like we get all these awesome visuals and like this amazing score and this darkness and cults and satanic panic and all this shit and i'm like really you know i mean i guess from certain standpoint you could be like well does it really matter too much but in, in this sense it kind of does because you want the reveal to be something kind of cool at this point I didn't, yeah, I and the thing too is like, like you were saying about the narrative, like he's really, I feel like he's really just going for it in this movie. Like he really wants it. He wants to hit, he wants to hit a home run in this movie. And even with the style wrapping up with the narrative, it does get muddled at times. And that like, in some of the editing, it just doesn't really make a lot of sense. No. Uh, it, but like, it also, I think of the three movies, it has like some of the best individual moments in the highest ceiling. And mm -hmm. I don't think just like mediocre or even like kind of good directors like go so wrong where like they have moments of greatness and like moments they're also poor in the same movie. Mm -hmm. So it's still like a con like he nails some stuff and it's still a compliment to Sergio. And I think for the moments he nails, like to be exploring this corner of horror, it's definitely a movie that is a little slept on. Right. Right. I think actually one of the coolest scenes is, um, is it the scene where she goes out to the country? Yeah, when she goes out to the country house and and the fucking old couple is is found dead. <laughs> but honestly, that shit doesn't really even make a lot of sense to me. But it makes no sense. But it's kind of cool <laughs> because when in reality you couldn't kill both of them at the same time and have them fucking you know kind of staged like that and shit. Like, but it's yeah. cool and it's creepy to like yeah. they're they're, they're kind of like trapped in this moment of of death and like you know and uh, it, I don't know. It, it's it's just a really creepy odd scene that in reality wouldn't work the way it's projected to the audience but 
you know, it's still cool to see. I think it's kind of cool. But yeah, so is y'all good? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I. I I do think I do it. think I do think that there was one missed opportunity with the the body getting um, thrown off the roof there. Martin, he should have just let the dummy hit the gr- like dummy, film the man. dummy yeah. hitting yeah. the ground. <laughs> film the dummy. <laughs> they cut away and then you fuck you see that person dead on the on the street and you're just like, oh man, it would have been so awesome just to have that thing bounce off the ground and. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but like, I think one of my favorite things about dummy deaths is literally the dummy floating through the air. Cause yeah, it dude, I was going to so, say that it looks so dumb, hence dummy, but it looks so bad. <laughs> like, it looks I like some ink time. It is, I was man. not high on dummy deaths when we first started this, but over time moods has really changed my mind. On I know this. I'm, I'm like known as the dummy <laughs> death guy. Cause it always kills me. Cause now I love them. <laughs> they got, they have their quirks to it. They definitely have a charm. Like you can't yeah. deny it. the way that dummy floats and has like a second, of hang time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it just looks a- so unnatural, right? Because if someone's yeah. falling off a roof, Nobody's most like, of the time they're not. <laughs> yeah, it's like a on. pancake. It's like a pancake. He's not moving at all. Yeah. He's just like staying face stationary, floating to the ground. It, it, it's <laughs> like they're trying to like when you watch like the divers, like the competitive divers. He like you know after they do their rotations and shit, and they get all stiff to like make as little splash as possible. <laughs> That's what it is, yeah. <laughs> well, it's just funny because most people that go off a cliff or get thrown off a, a building or something like that, they don't die until they hit the ground. But like with yeah. the dummies, they're they're already dead because they're not yeah. moving. They're just they're just floating down like a pancake. You know, it's fucking hilarious to me. You know, it's killing yeah. me. <laughs> Oh, I love Somebody it. needs to make a movie where all the kills are dummy deaths. Every one of them. Uh, and, and, actually, and actually call it dummy death. Oh my God, dude. It'd be yeah. the funniest thing ever. <laughs> Who's the dummy now? <laughs> yeah, uh, dude. Yeah. And you know, you know what else is weird about this film too? Like you kind of lose yourself because you're not watching like cannibal films and, and now they're like type of gels you gen- generally don't see potential animals be obviously the dog in this movie was not a real dog that got killed but that little puppy was cute man and they sacrificed the puppy in the film i'm just like bro it's cute yeah <laughs> yeah it just it, it just seemed like he was just kind of mean showcase this little cute puppy and i'll say bam we're gutting you but yeah you know me be one second guys yeah animal Animals are a little still soft spot for me right now. Well, yeah, I guess so, right? Yeah, for sure. But, um, I don't know what else to. I think that's. I think we're good. I think we're good too. You're up. Oh, I'm up. Okay. Um. Yeah. So all colors of the dark, man. It's uh. Well, it's in the title, man. It's a dark film. It's a dark, nightmarish kind of, you know, dark toned well scored well shot well acted film with i think the weakest of the narratives i just you know it just kind of sucks that this one doesn't tie up as strongly as the other films especially the other like they're just they're so well written in this one i feel really you could almost make the argument that it's more um you know it's more stylistic than anything in a sense right Mm -hmm. um you know i mean we've had this argument a lot of people you know with suspiria same thing more style over substance kind of thing. Um, I, I think this one could have that argument, even though I don't think it, I mean, it has its points and stuff, but I still think it's pretty weak, but I, that's really my biggest gripe with this one. I really do like this film. Um, I'm going to come in at a, also an eight out of 10 on this one. Okay. Right. Yes. So I kind of basically agree with like you guys, like same sediments on like, it's, it's messy. It's very messy narratively. And there's some dots that don't like really all connect. But I think it like it has the best moments. I think it's stylistically the strongest, but I can't really you can't completely ignore like how it does get muddled like that. I think Strange uh Strange Vice is like the perfect marriage of both uh his writing, like his ability to write a film and keep it tense and his ability to like push his style. Um so I, I would put that as his best one. I'd put this one just under it at a strong seven. Right. Uh yeah, me um definitely came up on this one uh i give it a seven and a half out of ten yeah i was i was kind of heating at home with that i was seven and a half eight i was kind of in the same thing i don't know maybe i probably should have went with seven and a half i feel like that's actually like the appropriate rating for it so i'm i'm, I'm also going to come in at seven and a half on this one just okay yeah gotcha gotcha 
All right. So, yeah, all the colors of the dark from 1970. Dukes. Yeah. Go check out the top 10 show if you haven't. <laughs> Shameless plug. Um, all right. Well, I guess that's going to conclude episode 231, week three here on Italian Horror Month. Nine? Eight. I do it every time. <laughs> every fucking time. Right. Every right. time. I don't know why I keep thinking it's nine. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't. I don't have an explanation Probably because we're in our ninth, we're going into our 10th year. So right. it just feels like we've been doing it from the beginning. Right. So Italian horror month, volume eight, uh, week three. And yeah, man, um, Tyler, thanks for coming on, man. It was, uh, it was good talking to you. Um, you did good. Uh, really good. Really, really good. Yeah. I told the other guys in the chat, I was like, you know, if Tyler sucks, we'll never do this. We'll never invite another listener on again. <laughs> <laughs> no, no pressure, Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, gee, right. guys, thanks for having me. It was yeah, fun. it was fun times. It was fun times. You gonna I, come back? I'll come back if you'll have me back. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah sounds good, man. Back. I have no idea how long this ran for because we're using Zoom for the very first time because apparently Skype does not work anymore. I have no idea. Um, I feel like this was better for me. It was I, definitely, definitely better. There were still some technical difficulties, but nowhere near as much as Skype. Yeah, it's nothing that, you know, we probably don't have before and stuff like that, but whatever. It is what it is. But uh, yeah, no, so hopefully it sounds okay. I really don't. Yeah, it's going to take me a little bit longer to put this one together, I think, but we'll figure it out. Yep. And um, yeah, we'll be back next week with uh, Luciano Nadi and. Um, That'll be the conclusion of Italian hormones. So, and, and then I be- we go into the Christmas season, Christmas Hell season, yeah. which I think we just, I think the only show lined up actually is the Christmas, is the Christmas show. Christmas show. So yeah, I think we have room for one other show. Yeah. So we'll, we can figure that out. We'll probably figure out something in that time. And actually we're just figuring out what the Christmas show film is going to be. Well, not film. We already have two. We picked two. So we're figuring out the third one from the uh, the listeners out there and uh yeah so i guess that remains to be seen actually i, pr- I pretty much know what it's going to be yeah. it, it, it's probably well i mean i kind of looked at the choices and i i'm thinking i'm thinking day of the beast is probably going to get picked but who knows i was going to say is that still significantly far ahead oh was it yeah, i just 40, i just remembered what we were percent oh, okay oh. well there you go so, oh, yeah. i actually wasn't going to add it i had a different film picked but Mood said it was too depressing, so I was like, you know, I'll, I'll cut it for this year. Oh, I don't, that's the kind of stuff I like. I don't know uh, if I could rewatch Silent that Night. movie, man. <laughs> I don't know if I could rewatch that movie, man. Mm. Oh, dude, I'll, that try, was, I'll try to watch that this year. It's so oh, it made my top ten, man. It was good. It, it's it, depressing, but it's good. Like I like that. I like that movie is movies. that movie is a product of being made during COVID. One hundred percent. Oh, it's a new. Oh, I remember. Yeah, you remember you talking about. <laughs> yeah, it? dude. And I looked it up and I was like really interested in it. Like the, I'm looking at the letterbox right now and it looks like a fucking like lifetime movie. Uh, no, it does. I, it really does. Like you wouldn't think that it was like anything. It's on the AMC. I'll definitely watch it. It's only ninety two minutes. Maybe I'll even watch it tonight if I'm feeling. Do it. Well, right. they got Kira Knightley and Matthew Good in this. They got some production value. Yeah, it's a good movie um i guess that's it we'll see you guys next week yep sounds good all right, all right. guys peace out deuces peace. that's all folks